fees, I would like to clarify because this is a little bit different format. What we're seeing up on the screen right here is what the public is seeing at this point. There may be some presentations tonight where there will be some either video footage or PowerPoint and we'll be able to look up there unless you know we have to get more creative, but just, just in terms of just getting comfortable with this format um, tonight. When it comes to a public comment, uh, what I'd like to review is this, is that for public com uh, comment by teleconference, we accept public comment in two ways. One through email, where Kwai Bok, executive assistant, has received information by noon of the previous day by email, which we're prepared to read during public comment to you tonight. And then in addition, the public can make public comment by uh, teleconference. Um, normally that happens during the course of the board meeting, but what happened, I think, with just the interest in this board meeting tonight is we already know of, of a number of people that would like to make public comment. So what, I, what I'd like to clarify um, is this, is that um, right at this point we have public comment for reopening schools of 17 um, community members or staff. And we have about 12 emails that we plan to read to you when we get to the reopening model. So what we're going to do, we're just gonna get acclimated a little bit here. First of all, again, I do want to say that the session is being recorded and that um, there could be right now some people who did not let Kwaibok know that they would like to make public comment regarding reopening. So we have 17 people who would like to make public comment. And so uh, Mrs. Bach and uh, Mrs. Heron, who is present here tonight, what um, I'd like to do is if you are wanting to make public comment about reopening and you did not let Kwai Bach or April Heron know already, if you would please indicate with the um, raising hand icon that you would like to make public comment about reopening. We're gonna take about one minute and then Mrs. Bach or Mrs. Heron will let our board know if there are additional members. We do have 17 people who would like to make public comment when we get to that item. And what I'd also like to say is that some people who are joining us tonight may have wanted to make public comment. And if you change your mind and you've not, you're, you're able to <clears throat> unraise your hand for public comment, you're able to do that. So again, we will be flexible tonight, but just know uh, we're wanting to ask this up front. Going to give it about another 30 seconds. And then we'll ask either Mrs. Heron or Mrs. Bach to let us know. And while they're doing that also just for our public who's joining us tonight, that if you do make public comment, public comment is limited to three minutes and our emails that we've received um, are no more than 450 words. And our plan tonight is to keep it at three minutes for public comment and that we will let you know um, when you have about 30 seconds to go. So we're gonna be very, uh, be very efficient working with you on that. And uh, Mrs. Del Toro Aguiano, what do you think? Yeah, I think we just need to remind them there's a three minute limit mm -hmm. and uh, Mrs. Karen will give us a warning when they have about 30 seconds left. Yeah. If they hit that three minute mark, I will ask Mrs. Bach to move to the next uh, person. Yeah. So could I ask this, either Mrs. Bach or Mrs. Heron, do we have any, uh, you, do, you do not need to mention the names, but if you could tell us, are there any more community members or public that would like to make public comment and how many? About yes, Dr. Shower, we have an additional 16 requests one that is unnamed, so I, I'm not going to be able to call on that person. Um, I also have um, I also have two more requests um, 
in our FAQ, or excuse me, in our Q&A. So a total of 18 more at this time. Okay. All right. Dr. Sherwood, did she say 18 more? Yes. So, okay. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. All right. And what I'd like to also say is that um, our board meeting tonight is going to start with um, we have an item related to a conference, and then it's going to move into action items. Then we're going to move to report. And depending on what the time is and how the schedule is, we can make some um, adjustments along the way. Okay. All right. So, so again, as we get going here, um, there could be action items for our public that you would like to make public comment. That's where you can raise your hand with the icon as we go along. So I'm going to turn this back to our board president and here we go. All right. So first order of business is um, recognition. He is an active participant in the Yes 2020 Census Club and is working on a public speaking census promotion project to present at the April um, district board meeting. She has future aspirations to become a special education teacher, therefore, she helps and assists to fill a special needs class on Fridays during her lunchtime. So, this again was last year as a seventh grader, she's an eighth grader now, but I did have a chance to meet with Cassidy and Mr. Raymer and her mom a few weeks ago at McCaffrey. There's a picture there of Mr. Raymer and Cassidy. They were very thankful and appreciative of the iPad and a nice certificate for her. So we were happy that we were able to finally get that to her. Congratulations, that's amazing. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, next is the governance team discussion on the California School Board Association Annual Education Com Conference. Okay. Um, I just wanted to share with the board, we, there was a request to uh, just provide additional information about the conference and the session. Know that um, there is registration that um, you know, can take place starting now. And I think our, just our initial question now and, and, and uh, registration can happen after this month is, is are there any board members <clears throat> that um, are interested in attending at this time. And it may be that you want to think about it, but, uh, and I thought Koi Bach, um, Mrs. Bach, is there information in terms of just the, I think we were talking about this today, is that the $399 registration fee is constant. That does not go up or down. Is that correct? That is correct. And we can register up until November 24th. I'm, I'm sorry uh, to hear that. Oh, no, you were asking if I was uh, presenting this year. No, um, I was curious that what you put in, in the uh, binder, are, are all those, are these all the uh, workshops and presentations for this year at the conference? Yes, as far as I'm aware, those are all the sessions that are being offered. Um, board, President Molson, I would like to note that we are losing sound occasionally. Um, so an example is during Lois's report, we lost sound for about 10 seconds. And I know um, IT is working on it. Okay, thank you. All right, and, and Mrs. Bach, if there are board members that are interested, they can just email or call you and you'll work on registration. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are you interested? Or... 
get that to Kauai. Yeah, interested, but I'll have to get back to Kauai because I don't know if I can fit that into my schedule this year. Unfortunately, I know I can't. What's going on with work right now, but. Okay, so then we will move on to routine matters and new business. The consent calendar, do we have, are there any um, resignations or retirements that we no, want to recognize? Yes, let me, uh, donations. Just for a second, we do have uh, donations that I would like to review with the board um, that are in the consent calendar. Brenda Flutie um, made a monetary donation for Fairsight. At Lake Canyon, donors choose to raise over $300 for a one-year um, subscription or membership to Happy Numbers for Stephanie Kahn's classroom. Walmart donated two pallets of school supplies and backpacks valued at $2,000 uh, for Lake Canyon. And at River Oaks, Donna Gill, principal, donated $700 for site use. It's very generous of Walmart to donate that. Okay, so then do thank I, you, Donna. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Move to approve. Is that a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. The motion, um, I'm so sorry. One moment. Thank you. The motion, motion 202122, the consent calendar passes 5-0. Yes. Thank you. And Kawhi, does that work for you with us doing it the normal way? You know, I will continue to name off who motions first and second. I'm sorry I didn't catch that just now, um, but it is being recorded. Okay, it was John made the motion and Matt seconded. Thank you. Welcome. So would it be easier to read us, read off the names after the first and second? Sure, I can do that. Um, Whatever is easiest for you. Yes. Yeah, Terry, Terry. Make a I was, I was, this is Karen. I, I just wanted to make a suggestion that might be a good I'm sorry, the sound, we lost sound again. Are you there? Yes, yes. Okay, okay I can hear now. Um, a motion was made by John Gordon to pass uh, item number 202122, seconded um, by Matthew Felix. Wes Cagle? Aye. Thomas Silva? Aye. Grace Malson? Aye. Thank you. The motion passes 5 0. Right. Next, we have agenda item 202.124 board consideration of approval of Ed Viewpoint license agreement for the use of the Synergy student educational platform. Okay. Um, as I brought to you two months ago, we have since uh, the 2000. Um, 19, 22 years, we were notified that our current student information system, um, which is Illuminate, would no longer be available um, by two, June of 2021. And so in your packet, I kind of just outlined some of the process that we went through to select a new student information system vendor. We started with the top four vendors, and we did a lot of feedback gathering, phone calls, um, Nindo, our technology coordinator, and a team actually visited um, five or six school um, districts and to check out the, the student information systems and how that um, it was running for them. Based on the research that was collected, we narrowed the vendors down to Infinite Campus and Synergy, which is um, part of EduPoint. Um, we then uh, assembled a district team from sites and included classified, certificated, and administrators um, to go through the presentation with those two vendors, and they filled out uh, the feedback form. And at the end, um, as a district team, we did select uh, EduPoint, the Synergy program. I wanted to just a few notable highlights for Synergy really quickly. 
is first of all, it's very visual and easy to follow. It's an ease of use. The parent portal is called Parent View. My parents have uh, have said that it's very easy and, and, and it's it's um it, it's very uh, convenient to use. It integrates fully with Google Classroom. Our parents in the future will be able to complete all registration online. They will not have to do it. They can online registration. And uh, for middle school, it has a master schedule builder, which is something that we are in great need of you know, work for middle school. Um, if approved by the school board, we will go ahead with the contract and um, and our technology coordinator, Mindo, will work um, with EduPoint and start the migration of data. And we thought we'd start with some training, then the migration of the data will probably begin in January. And um, the contract does include um, train the trainer, um, other professional development services. And so we thought by this spring, we would start training our key staff, our office staff, um, district staff, classified, and, and then in next August, when teachers come back, we would then do the training for the teachers on grade book and taking attendance. But I do, we're recommending um, board approval tonight for the Synergy Student Information System. Are there any questions? Uh, I got some more. I got a question. Uh, how often are the, uh, the student information systems replaced? What's the average lifespan? I'm I, I'm not sure. It's as far as replaced, you know, I mean, upgraded or yeah. going to a different com a company. Yeah, like like the Illuminate. How long does it do we have Illuminate for? How long do we have Illuminate since for? Race to the Top? Five years. Well, more than that. More since Race to the five Top, years. since probably about 2012, yeah. 2011. You know, five to eight years. Five to eight years. And you know what, what it is, is Illuminate is just dropping that portion. They're still using the um, data and analysis portion, but they just decided to step back from the student information portion. And so that's the only reason that we moved away from, from um, Illuminate. Um, the other companies um, don't necessarily replace, but they do, they, they're going to upgrade annually their services. I'm just curious, the uh, parent portal, um, does it have a phone-based app or is it strictly web-based? Um, it's got a, it has a phone-based app that's, uh, you know, very easy and very visual and easy to use. And I think actually Lois uses it. I, I do, I use it as an Elko parent and I love it. It's very user-friendly. It's all on the app. All right, and then, so then my follow-up question to you then is, because um, you mentioned that we're going to train up our teachers on how are we going to need to train up our parents on how to use it too, or is it fairly intuitive? You know, we really didn't need much. There was a flyer that went out and said, download this app, and it was, we had to get a passcode from the school to uh -huh. log in, and we log in, and it's very user friendly. Okay. The student view also does. Yes, it. yes. So my the kids have their own password to see the student view, and they can email their teachers securely through the app, and then the parents have an app. Oh, okay, so it works a lot like Canvas to the mm -hmm. in terms of parent and student access. Okay, yeah. excellent. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, there's no further questions. Do I have a motion to approve 202.124? I'll move to approve item 202.124. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Thanks, Wes. Thank you. I have a motion from Tom Silva to approve item 202124, seconded by Wesley Cagle. John Gordon? Aye. Matthew Felix? Aye. Grace Molson? Aye. Thank you. The motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Okay, next agenda item. Um, 202.125, board consideration of approval of pupil transportation information, LLC, PTI, school transportation consultation services agreement for professional services with Timothy W. Purvis. All right, thank you. The PTI were the transportation consultants that provided the school's transportation um, the, 
comprehensive study last spring, and we looked at lots of recommendations that came out of that study. And one of the recommendations was for the two school districts, the elementary and the high school, to look at a new agreement on how we would operate transportation together. And so in coordination with the high school district, um, we have decided to reach out again to these consultants to help us with planning this year for a new agreement that ultimately we can work out all the details, um, both with our, with our unions, both unions, um, transferring over fleet, possibly consolidating routes at some point, looking at the cost saving points. Um, we would like to use these consultants to plan. The goal would be, um, if everything comes together and it's cost effective for both districts, the goal would be for the elementary district to take over full responsibility of transportation and we would charge um, the high school accordingly. Um, we know it will take at least a year to do this and we know we would need some consultant support to, to also do this. Um, just coming up with, speak louder, uh, just alone coming up with um, how to determine the, the cost to buy over the fleet from the high school. Um, how do we determine the cost to charge the high school district for the services? And so these, these two consultants, you met them, they came to the, the board meeting a few months back. They're highly recommended um, as experts in California. They work with many districts um, that have tried to consolidate in this way. Um, the contract is to not to exceed $10,000. It's on time and material. It's as much as we use them. We would share this with the high school district, so neither district would pay more than $5,000. Um, the high school district is taking this to their board within, within the next week, I believe, is their board meeting. Um, but again, it just this contract right now just allows us to consult with these experts to make some plans. Um, and then if we did come up with a new agreement and we did decide to consolidate in the elementary take it for responsibility, we would have a new agreement that we would bring to you and uh, both boards would have to approve that. So a lot of work to do, but we feel that we um, we're at that place where the, the reason why we, we had the consultants come and help us last spring was because we knew we needed to make some changes with transportation. And so um, we're ready to move forward and um, work together to see how we can improve services. Is there any questions? I'm just curious. So um, how is this report received amongst the transportation department itself? Because I know there was a lot of suggestions for improvements and things like that. Did they agree with it? Did they think it was totally off base? I mean, how, how well was it received in terms of you know, what the transportation folks thought? You know, I, I think the biggest concerns are just working out the differences between uh, bargaining units because mm -hmm. it's different. You know, there's different units. The district or both districts, all the kids involved, but there is some there's some concern about how we're going to consolidate, especially when it comes to bargaining agreements and salaries. Sure. All right, no, I appreciate that, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, there's no further questions or discussion. Do I have a motion to approve 202.125? I'll make the motion to approve 202.125. Thanks, Wes. Do I have a second? Second. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. I have a motion from Wesley Cagle to approve item number 202125, seconded by Matthew Felix. John Gordon? Aye. Tom Silva? Aye. Grace Malson? Aye. Thank you. The motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Okay. So the next agenda item is a public hearing on um, 202.126. All right. So the district um, shares K-12 
developer fees with the high school district, and the elementary collects 60% of those fees, and our current rate right now um, at the level one is $2.21 per square foot of residential, and 36 cents per square foot for commercial. And it's that time of year where we have our school facility needs analysis done to determine what we can levy in terms of developer fees. Our school facility analysis provides the justification that the district can level the maximum level one fee, and that has increased at a $2.44 rate for residential and a 39 cent rate per square foot for commercial. In order for us to move forward with this, we have to have this public hearing and then we have to also approve resolution number five. And tonight we have with us Blair Oz from SCI Consulting Group. And he's been with us before and he provides every year for us our school facility analysis that just justifies our rationale for charging developer fees. Is he here virtually? He's here virtually, yes. Okay. Yes, he's virtual. So if the board has any questions about the analysis or the level one fees, um, we do have Blair with us. I think, can I open that for the public hearing first and then we have discussion? Is it, yes, and Blair is available. He is he available is, during yes. the discussion. Yes, if, okay. we have, if you have questions. Okay. But you, you can. Well, because we can do the public hearing and then we have to make the motion to have the discussion then, right? Then. Okay, I'm opening it for public hearing. Any questions? Why? No? I, I do not have any requests um, for the public hearing. Okay, so I will close the public hearing and then we will move on to let me make sure it's the right time. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, 202.127, which is the approval of resolution number five, the alternative level of one developer fees on new residential, commercial, and industrial construction within the Gulch Union Elementary School District. So now we have any discussion or have to just want to ask Blair anything. I think this is an annual thing. It, yes, it is annual. Does Blair have anything you want to right. add? Right. Does he have anything you'd like to add? Blair? Uh Yes, uh, good evening, uh, President Paulson, uh, Malson, uh, members of the board. It's uh, great to be with, here with you this evening. Again, as, as Lois had indicated, the, um, the, the level one fees, um, these fees are actually determined every two years and they're statutorily set. And so um, these, uh, this action is just to levy the state maximum allowable fees that's charged on um, on commercial and industrial construction within the district. And just so that there's not any confusion, the, there is a level one fee for residential development. Um, but the next action item for you before you this evening is to, um, is to levy an alternative to that fee. So you'll, you'll, you will, you'll, you likely will not be imposing the residential level one fee, although it you will you would be able to adopt it if necessary. But um, it is uh, so it it is it is adopted. But it, you will um, then the next action will be to consider um, the the adoption of the residential developer fee, which is an alternative to the level one fee because the the district has established. The eligibility for levying that that higher um, that higher fee on residential development. So when we collect these fees, what can the district use these fees for? Um, a great example of how we're using developer fees right now is to build the McCaffrey track. So it's for new school development. Um, you can also use it to repair portables. Um, yeah, we're, we're using a, a, most of our developer fees right now that we've collected over the last few years to build a cafe track. Any other questions? No? 
If not, then do I have a motion to approve 202.127? Move to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. I have a motion from John Gordon to approve item number 202.127, seconded by Tom Silva. Matthew Felix? Yes. Wesley Cagle? Yes. Grace Molson? Aye. Thank you. The motion passes 5 0. And moving on to 202.128. This is another public hearing. Um, it's at the resolution six approving an alternative level two fee, a new residential construction for the Galt Joint Union Elementary School District. As, as Blair mentioned, we are eligible to levy level two fees. We do bring this to the board annually, level two fees. We currently collect level two fees at $3.29 a square foot for residential. It has gone up slightly, not much. It would now be $3.33 per square foot. But again, this year we are um, eligible to continue to collect level two fees. All right, thank you. Right, I'm gonna open that for the public hearing. Board President Malson, I have no requests in our Q&A or um, no new hands raised. So no requests for public comment. Okay, thank you. I will close the public hearing. Okay, and then we'll move on. Thank you, Blair. Still there. <laughs> well, Blair, I do, have, I do have one question. Are you still there? I certainly am. Um, I just wanted to get clarity on when you can use go to level two fees it's, it's we're only restricted to residential you can't do level two fees on commercial or business <laughs> that yes that is correct the um the alternative the alternative fee that level two fee is restricted to just residential development Thank you. All right, any other questions on agenda item 202.129? Those are now on the board consideration of approval. Yeah, uh, just to point out, I have a question. So with all the development in town that is projected and that are going on, how much is the district looking to receive with these fees? Do you have any idea? We do. We have some preliminary projections that we've been working on based on the three developers that we have been working with. They would right now, unless we come up with another agreement with them, they would pay this $3.33 um, per square foot. At that rate, if all three developer developments went, it's probably about 4 or $5 million. Depends on the square footage, of course. We have rough estimates from them on what the square footage would be in those homes, but it's around three to four million right now, just estimate. So we're, we're projecting to, of course, build a new school, at least one. Mm -hmm. how, much it, how much is it costing right now to build a, an adequate school? $40 million is our estimate from our architect. And so that's why we have been working mm -hmm. so closely with our, our developers to, um, figure out how we would fund a new school because the level two developer fees won't get us anywhere near that. Any other questions? Okay, so if not, do I have a motion to approve um, agenda item 202.129? Move to approve. Okay, I'll second it. Thank you. I have a motion from John Gordon to approve item number 202-129, seconded by Grace Malson. Matthew Felix? Yes. Wesley Cagle? Yes. Thomas Silva? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes 5-0. All right, agenda item 202.130. And this is board consideration of approval to change the November regular board meeting date from November 25th to November 18th. 
we just would, would like for consideration to approve moving it the week before Thanksgiving break, or Thanksgiving holiday period. Any questions? Okay, then do I have a motion to approve 202.130? I'll make a motion. Thanks, Wes. Do I have a second? Second. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. I have a motion from Wes Cagle to approve item number 202-130, seconded by Matthew Felix. John Gordon? Aye. Thomas Silva? Aye. Grace Molson? Aye. Thank you. The motion passes 5-0. Okay, next agenda item 202.131, board consideration of approval of increasing the substitute teacher daily rate. Yes, thank you. Um, we are asking for board consideration to increase our daily substitute rate for our teachers. Um, currently, right now, our daily rate is anywhere from $125 to $135 a day, depending on how many days the substitute teacher works in that pay period. We have done some research um, surrounding districts and the high school district as well to see where we needed to be at a competitive rate, um, especially um, in this pandemic and knowing that it's always been. keeps us um, comparative to surrounding districts and in the high school as well. Any questions? Um, how many substitutes do we have right now? Boy, how many substitutes do we have right now that are actively kind of maybe subbed for us in the last couple of months or uh -huh. just in the sub pool? I would say subbing has looked very different these last few months, we have not used as much as many substitute teachers. We trained about 12 or 15 to, to be able to sub for us for distance learning. And, and we did we use all of, of those subs, but we really um, when we're in person learning. I, I say, how many subs do we use a month? Anywhere between 40 to 100, depending on the month and the activities that time. Because it's not only about um, illness, it can right. be professional development right. and release time for that, which, yeah. So that's how many we're using now or during? Prior to the, the pandemic, we were right. using uh, that number. Okay. Because of distance learning, we felt the need to train some of our substitutes to ensure they knew how to use things like Google Classroom. Uh, that they would know how to use Zoom, some of the features of Zoom. So those are the ones that Lois just mentioned. We trained about uh, 10 to 15 substitute teachers that are ready to be guest teachers in the classroom. Okay. Um, I'm just curious, um, because, you know, if you're comparing, you know, pay regionally, but do you have any idea, like, the percentage of, of substitutes that live locally um, as opposed to outside, you know, of Gulf? Because obviously, if you live in another town and it's paying a higher wage for substitutes, they're, they're going to be drawn to that as opposed to coming here. But I mean, just do you have a general idea how many of them? I, I could say off, off the top of my head, I, I know we do have quite a few local uh, and retired teachers as well that do sub for us. But we do hear from HR that substitutes will go where there is a higher daily rate, um, even if they have to drive 10, 15 miles, they'll, they will take the job first and the district that pays more. We hear that often. And we've had over the years, I think we've had some of our substitute teachers that have even come and talked to the board about that and asking the board to look at that and to please increase increase the rates. And, um, you know, I, once we get back to in-person learning, I think we will go back to meeting, you know, 40, 40 subs in a month. And it's probably going to be more difficult than ever to, to get substitute teachers. And so, we thought that this was a, a crucial time to make the, the pay a little more competitive. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, any other questions? Okay, if there's no more questions, then do I have a motion to approve 202.131? I'll move to approve. I'll second. 
Thank you. I have a motion from Matthew Felix to approve item number 202131, seconded by Thomas Silva. John Gordon? Aye. Wesley Cagle? Aye. Grace Molson? Aye. Thank you. The motion passes 5 0. Okay, the next agenda item 202.132. Board consideration of approval of the memorandum of understanding between the California School Employee Association and its Galt Chapter 362 in the Galt Joint Union Elementary School District regarding reduction in hours personnel tech. Okay, this is uh, an unfilled position um, that we've had now for a while. Um, and what we did is we worked with CSEA with our classified uh, bargaining unit to look at a reduction of hours. And that was uh, taken to membership and they did uh, ratify that. So we're bringing it to you tonight. Um, we think that in, in light of just um, with declining enrollment and resources and rethinking resources that uh, a reduction in hours um, is warranted at this time. We did agree that we would revisit this with CSCA in March. So once again, there's nobody in that position. That is correct. And, and by you moving forward, then we would work to post the position. Any other questions or comments? If not, then do I have a motion to approve 202.132? Move to approve. Thanks, John. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Thanks, Wes. Thank you. I have a motion from John Gordon to approve item number 202132, seconded by Wesley Cagle. Matthew Felix? Yes. Thomas Silva? Aye. Grace Molson? Aye. Thank you. The motion passes 5 0. Yeah, you can go ahead and open it and bring it forward. Okay. So the next agenda item is 202.133, the board consideration and possible action on potential memorandum of understanding between the Galt Elementary Faculty Association and the Galt Joint Union Elementary School District regarding on-campus blended instruction. A board of trustees and, and board president Molson, um, what I'd like to do is, is tell you that that the hope was that I would bring a tentative agreement um, to you tonight for uh, possible board action. Um, I, I want to share with you that um, I'm not able to do that this evening. I would like to provide you with an update on where we are with things in terms of moving forward with reopening and um, use that time uh, just to clarify kind of where we are with things. And because this is related to reopening, I felt that in the, with the update that I'll give you, um, there could be, again, um, some questions that you may have for me or staff and our principals are here this evening. This could be also where um, the public comment that we have related to reopening could come into, the, into this um, prior to board discussion around this. Right now. Not yet, not yet. We, I'd like to give you a, an update report. first. Yes. Okay. So, so what I'd like to do is give you an update in terms of since we did not reach a tentative agreement and we're working to reopen, I'd like to update the board about okay. that and clarify again, our directors and our principals and our prevention and intervention coordinator who are here today, there may be areas as I'm going through our timeline and our progress that it may be helpful. Um, our board may need our support to work together to inform on, on some things. And then um, again, I think after all of that, it may be that we go to public comment before some board discussion. Okay. So, so I, I was going to go ahead and, and, and start with a, a bit of a progress update here. I think again, um, it has been quite, quite a journey since last March. Um, to be able to provide education uh, throughout a pandemic 
and the work of our teachers, of our support staff, of our administrators, of our board of trustees, just everyone. It, it has it has been amazing. I know that with the board um, approval of our our initial transitional model, which happened last August, that we were working to follow the law in terms of being able to reopen for in-person instruction when it was safe to do so. And to do that, we created a model that went from distance learning to blended learning um, to a modified traditional model, depending on the severity of the pandemic level. And what happened was that on October 13th of, of this new school year, uh, County Public Health had indicated that schools could now reopen. And so we have been on a path to reopen when it was safe to do so. Um, Again, there has been work that we've been able to accomplish with our certificated and classified unions, and we're at a, a critical point again to try to move forward, move forward in that way. Uh, we had a special board meeting, as you recall, in mid-November, and at that or mid-October, in fact, it was October 14. And at that board meeting, um, there was public comment, um, there was information, there was board discussion. And at that time, based on our initial transitional model and the fact that we were now in tier red, the direction was for us to look to prepare to reopen um, at the beginning of the second trimester, somewhere around November 17th. That we also, uh, because again, there was action that was taken to support cohort groups um, to move forward with that. And also to look at how we could expand uh, our home learning efforts when if we're looking now to reopen on campus, there can be families that um, that's just not going to work for them. That's not a desire that they have. So following that board meeting, um, we continued our efforts to prepare for reopening and continued work um, with both our unions. I would like to ask Kwai Boss, um, executive assistant, Mrs. Boss, if you would please Hold up the uh, PowerPoint. Um, this is a, a timeline that I would like to review with the board. And the timeline, if if we're able to do this, you're going to see it up on the screen as um, Mrs. Bach is going to share it. And if not, I will verbally review it with you. You do not have this in your packet. Okay. And again, I just want to say a few things is that we um, progress is being made with both our labor unions to be able to move forward. Progress is being made, but again, we still need more time to be able to reach agreements that can work um, for, for our school system. And we truly want to be systems ready to reopen safely and fit efficiently. I think in the context of, of this update, there are, is more information that we can bring to you and questions that you may have that we can share with you about our efforts to be ready to reopen safely. Um, we are preparing to safely transition. Um, Kwai, you can go to the next slide, please. We are preparing to safely transition to reopen um, the week of November 30th. And on this potential timeline, I just would like to review what this could look like. It's a potential timeline. We're looking at what we're calling a transition week the week of November 16th. All teachers and support staff would work on school campus throughout the transition week. That includes time for training and practice of safety procedures in classroom preparation for on-campus instruction. That also means that the small cohorts that have begun um, in our school system, in fact, we have 18 uh, teachers at this time that have started some small cohort groups with high needs children, that this uh, could potentially could continue through November 20th. And that number three, we would look at reopening the week of November 30th. That would be our launch week. And we would be looking at an AM PM schedule um, 
with pre-kindergarten reopening for five days of instruction because they have different state guidelines to follow. And that all students in an AM PM model across our district, TK8, would attend school four days per week in the morning or the afternoon. And that there is independent teacher assigned work that's provided for home completion when the children are not at school. And on the next slide, what you see is a, an overview of, a, of an AM PM schedule. And I want to say that this has been a team effort of, of just so many to get here. And I, I'm going to ask Jennifer Porter, elementary principal, and then uh, middle school principal, Ron Raymer. Jennifer, would you please come over to this area here? And I'd like you to join us. Um, we'll take all the podium. <laughs> Jennifer, I think, and uh, obviously Mrs. Heron and um, Mr. Doe, is that, is that a good spot for, for Mrs. Yes. Porter? Yes, it is. Okay, very good. Okay, so what we have here is, is you know, there, there are different ways to portray this, but we work to come up with a, I would say maybe the most simple way to share what an AM PM schedule could look like. Jennifer and others, I mean, all of our principals, their teachers or others have given feedback into this. Jennifer, would you walk us through this? Please, because you again, you've just helped me. You helped me to create this slide. Too. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. So, if um, and this is just an example of what it could look like for an AMPM model for an elementary school. Um, children that were on the AM schedule would have in-person instruction in the classroom, and that would be in that morning block of time. The timelines are not exact, but it could be from 8.10 to about 10.40, so about an hour and a half, two, hour, two hours and 30 minutes, I'm sorry, um, for in-person instruction in the classroom. Lunches would be delivered to the classrooms, and then those kids in the morning block would go home, and they would have their lunch and their recess and their break time, and then they would have independent work that the teacher would be assigning, and it could be... Um, online learning platforms, it could be homework, it could be assigned reading that they would complete in the afternoon while they're at home. And while that's going on, you have the other half of the kids who are on the PM schedule. And what their day would look like would be they would be doing that teacher assigned work in the morning at home. And uh, then they would come to school in the afternoon and uh, they would have from about 12.20 to 2.50 for in-person learning. And their lunches for the next day would be delivered to their classrooms and they would eat them the next day before they come to school. So that's a sample of what it would look like at the elementary school. So half the kids would come in the morning for in-person and half the kids would come in the afternoon for in-person. And maybe that you have some questions or discussion around that schedule and okay. that our team could. I have a couple. The biggest one that uh, I've been approached about is how will you decide what students go AM and what students go PM? And uh, I guess the other one was, it was why was this like decided to be the best schedule? Um, the the distribution of the students between the AM and the PM schedule, we're gonna to have to think very carefully about how we do that. Probably the most equitable way of doing that would be just to split it alphabetically. Um, and then also taking into consideration some unique needs of different families. Um, and the reason that we talked about AM, PM in the first place was when we did the, the teacher survey, we got a lot of feedback from our teachers in the district that said, please consider this type of schedule because we would be able to see the children four days a week instead of two days a week. Well, see, that's interesting because I've heard from teachers that they are nervous about this schedule because they're afraid to be double the work and they wouldn't be able to assist the AM students because they'll be with the PM students. So... They'll be with their morning, half of their class in the morning and the other half of their class in the afternoon. So they'll see all of their students mm -hmm. four days a week. 
And so yes. when would they be available if the AM students need additional help? We do not have um, students in school on Monday, so there'll be a lot of time for teachers to plan, communicate with families, make sure that the kids know what they're doing. But just like we do with homework now, is that send kids home to do homework that they're not able to complete independently. So they'll be focusing on, on those same types of strategies when they're not with the teachers. No. Okay, thank you. So I'm just curious then, I mean, with this schedule, so then when a teacher teaches a block of instruction from 8 to 1040 or 8 to 1040, then they're teaching the same block to the PM. So it's not like math in the morning and English in the afternoon. It's the same, same schedule in, in two and a half hours. Yeah. Okay. And then most of the teachers, I mean, the, because obviously the teachers said that they thought that that the AM schedule, AM PM schedule was, was better than an AB. Um, do they see that as doable? Or because again, we talk about you know doubling the workload. I guess, I mean, I guess you're really not. I mean, do they feel like they're doubling it, or is it because you're splitting the class in half? It's really not. Right. Small, you'll have a, they'll have a smaller group for more personalized and individualized instruction when they're in the classroom. They'll be between 10 and 15 students in the classroom, depending on how many kids are enrolled. So if you have a 20 student first grade class, they'll only have 10 kids in each of those groups. Okay. Um, then I have a question and maybe we're gonna talk about it in LCAP full one, but um, I know that another big thing I'm hearing from parents is um, after school care. So is that gonna be available on campus, especially with this, you know, parents are working, they can't leave at 1040 in the morning. I mean, that's not, that's not even to their first break at work to come pick up their children. Um, yeah. I can, yeah. I can, I can, I can um, give you some information on that. We are, well, currently we do have ACEs coming back onto campus for small cohorts during the day to provide distance learning support. But when we do reopen, we are planning on reopening with after-school services for ACEs, and we've been meeting regularly, monthly, with uh, Golf Parks and Rec for the SOAR program okay. of the three sites that don't currently have ACEs to provide that after-school care. We are also looking into a couple of uh, uh, Sacramento County school districts that are working and looking at care during the day. Well, the staff. Also, yeah. Well, I'll so I was thinking, you know, with, um, you know, the parents have to get to work by eight, how they're going to get their child to their school at, you know, 220 or 1220. So is there going to be on-campus services for those families? We are looking into it right okay. now. We do know that we will be providing the after-school services on the sites. And we are looking into providing whether it be, might be through ACEs or be additional staff looking into possibly providing some child care and some um, support for staff and possibly families. Thank you. So the time in between the AM PM, uh, teachers go to lunch, the classrooms get cleaned. Correct. So then it would be the same thing for after school. So when the teachers will have to, I'm guess get out, uh, get out of the classrooms by three fifteen ish. To clean it for after school care. Well, after Elementary school. teachers are notoriously there yeah. late all the time. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. will be cleaned in between and then after, after. the lessons. So, because yeah. yeah, like, where will ACEs be if if most teachers are going to be? ACEs will need to be in their own classrooms. They may use part of, for example, the multi-purpose room. And most of our ACEs sites, um, our ACEs sites, they do have areas. The, the sizes of ACEs or SOAR will not be the same. We're looking at, at, uh, at groups of uh, 10 per adult for ACEs. So there will be less students on so, campus. Uh, Marengo has Champion. So will, are they gonna be operating and helping, helping us out? I, I hope so, but I don't know because they operate outside of our district. Oh, okay. And the uh, woman that's been um, in charge of Champions uh, is retiring this year, so they they're looking for someone else to run that. But uh, is that, I, I don't know of any other school that have a program like Champions. Is is there? 
Yeah. No, no longer sore. There's no longer sore. Yeah. Uh, it is a phenomenal fee. But like I said, they are 100% on board to work with us to um, serve children after school when we reopen. They've successfully served children in our golf community throughout the summer in summer camps. And so they're well prepared. So I'm imagining if I'm a parent and I'm going to need my child in SOAR, that somehow my child will be in the PM. We have to take that into consideration. Yeah, it could be. And also look taking into consideration staff that may have, you know, also okay. needs with their children who will be in school, you know, AM or PM. Could you share or I'm curious, so what what do these two and a half hours of direct instruction in the schedule look like if we have broken it down to that level yet? And how does that differ than distance learning, which maybe is maybe a longer block of time? Can you explain what would, you know, whether it's they're looking at math. This time they're looking at reading, looking at English, and looking, you know, what does this kind of look like? And then compare it to, to what we're currently doing. Right. Um, they would have a heavy concentration of very um, personalized instruction for mathematics, for language arts, for writing. The writing has been a huge challenge to try to do through distance learning. Um, and the teachers would be able to work directly with the students on those writing tasks. Um, that's going to take up a lot of that time frame. And for the primary teachers, you're going to add in that whole piece of reading instruction that has to happen for those foundational skills. And that has been probably one of our biggest challenges with elementary schools and Zooming is trying to teach reading. So those are going to be the main things that will happen during those in-person learning blocks. Yeah, I, I, I heard that the the, the Google Docs to download, like the teachers have to upload the, the assignments and then the students. Um, and, and, and it's amazing because I've been talking to some parents uh, about how so adapted the kids are of using their computers and using and, and downloading those, those documents and, fill, and doing the homework right there. It's just like, I, I, as an adult, it's, it's hard to fathom. How, 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 you're not wrong. How, how they far they came. <laughs> because yeah. I'm like, I don't, some of that stuff, I, I don't think I could help them. So, and so for this block, two and a half hours, no recess, it's just straight right on through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we still have uh, things like PE or um, for elementary schools, we have classroom music for some of the grade levels. That would continue during that time where kids were not at school. So that would be through Zoom with PE and music. Um, some specialized services would also take place during that time, things like speech. And um, so even when we're looking at that block of time when kids are not here, that's, that's pretty structured as well in terms of what they're going to be asked to do. It's just such a social element of of going to school that's largely absent. I think people are really, you know, nervous about that, you know, bringing kids in, they're stuck in their seat, you know, for two and a half hours, and they're shipped off, you know, back home and, and what that, you know, how realistic I guess that is for young folks who kind of need to be out and seeing, you know, things around them and, and interacting, so. Um, Pretty aggressive. We, we'd like to have them back full day with all of them yeah. in the classroom at the same time. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, that's not something we can do right now. Yeah. Is there a reason why PE wouldn't be um, in person? Another, and the only reason I ask is I mean, PE is definitely one of those. I mean, you could teach, I mean, all, okay, all subjects in person are better. However, math and social studies, reading, they can be teached over Zoom. PE, not so much. 
I, I don't, that's my personal thought on that is he, I think, I mean, social distancing, somehow let them just run back and forth, make sure they're being physical because it's so simple to say, oh yeah, I went outside and I ran up down my street. No, they didn't. <laughs> and that's the reality. So is there a specific reason why that wouldn't be taught in person? So I think Mr. Raymer's going to be able to address that for middle school, but for elementary, we have one PE teacher that has to teach every single PE class. So when we talk about cohorts and not having uh, contact with, with lots of different people in the different cohorts, we're just not able to do that at the elementary school for live instruction. For the and so the actual teacher just couldn't take them outside and do anything physical with that? No, no. Yeah. Oh, okay. She would like to. I knew that she's very concerned that if I could do that, but right now we're not going to be able to do that. Okay. Then just one quick question to follow up on that. Do you see a point where potentially we can incorporate the play time into, in, into an AM, PM type schedule? If it's possible for us to do that, I'm sure we would, we would absolutely love to be able to do that. I'm sure that the teachers will do break up with their students. Yeah. It's not to say that it will be two and a half hours of straight instruction. Right. The teachers will be doing, you know, taking breaks, rest breaks, you know, brain breaks, and doing that. And it's also just, just not the traditional is, recess. Not the traditional right. recess, but it's not to say that if they can't go outside together for 10 minutes, just that they won't, it won't be free to play outside on a playground with the uh, other 80 children. It'll be just with the classroom teacher if there's a break. So I don't think that we're not saying that they're going to sit in their seats for like two and a half hours. Okay, I appreciate that. All right. All right. We'll, we'll move on to uh, middle school. The next slide. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Porter. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Um, the next slide, again, I think what we're looking at here is an AMPM model that would be used at both elementary and middle school. And there are some subtle differences, but the good news on this is it may help um, with coordination with families who have children at the elementary and middle school. And again, it is somewhat of a, a similar schedule for our families within one district for elementary and middle school. Mr. Raymer and staff and others, and, and again, our, our labor union, our certificated union, been working on um, just what this could look like. So this is not a final schedule. This is like an overview, it's a sample. So I thought Mr. Raymer, um, and I know also that you've been conferring with more than one uh, middle school that have already reopened, but if you could walk our board um, through this and maybe also share some of what you've learned at some of the middle schools that have reopened. Sure. The, um, you know, middle school, you just have to really switch your thinking. And this is a model. So you can adjust it five minutes, 10 minutes each. I mean, you can do all those kind of things. So you really got to think of this as a model. Uh, and I can't really see the model because I don't have my glasses on, but I can see it here in front of me. So I'm hoping it's the same line uh, time wise. So it's a similar block in the AM and a block in the PM. Um, what we would try to do is coordinate with our elementary schools so that the kids that come in AM or PM um, are coordinated, you know, to try to help the parents out. John asked a question about. Um, about time and you know you can't the time with our teachers and the magic they work with these kids um, what they've been asked to do in a very short amount of time uh, basically reinvent an education system that can't be replaced and so any time with them is much can be much more positive than distance learning time but you have to be aware based on john's question that right now through distance learning, synchronous time is 900 minutes. Um, these are single subject teachers, so they don't have the flexibility that an elementary teacher has to have a block. Our kids have to go through six different uh, periods each day. If you said, well, we need to focus on these certain subjects, well, you're gonna have a lot of teachers that don't have a job to do. So they, the kids have six different classes that they have to go through. 
Um, knowing this, right now they're doing 900 minutes of synchronous time and um, using the system that we're talking about, the minutes would decrease by about 47% down to 480 minutes because they would be seeing the kids twice for two 40 minute blocks. So they would be seeing 80 minutes times six classes is 480 minutes. Right now they have 150 minutes. I'm sorry, they have um, 180 minutes times five days is 900 minutes. So that's where you get the decrease in time. So the question is, if they come to school and they have a decrease in time, but they're with their, with their teacher, is that, more, is that gonna improve student achievement? Um, so that's based on John's question. I, may, I wanted to make sure we address that and think about that. Um, the, the day would look very similar to elementary school. You'd have an AM block, then there would be an hour and a half in between AM and PM where disinfecting and cleaning would take place while the teachers are prepping and meeting with their uh, PLCs and taking their lunch and things like that. Then the PM group would come in. There is a little bit of difference in time, which will help out with um, elementary school being dropped off and then middle school starting a little bit later and being dropped off. So um, I think that will be a benefit. As far as um, what's gonna happen after school and things, I, I think we have ACES program at our school, so we can, we can uh, have that program up and running for after school care um, or continued learning. There is gonna be a lot of time though, to be honest, you know, there's gonna be a lot of time where the kids are working asynchronously at home. Uh, teachers are gonna be assigning work. Um, the kids are gonna be expected to do it on their own because the teachers will be in class teaching. So that is uh, something that we also have to consider. Um, maybe questions. I could talk, there's a lot of things that are different from middle school, but. I, I'm just kind of curious and, and I'm, you know, like trying to think from a parent view, can you walk, just kind of walk us through like what, you know, like a single child, what their day would look like, whether they were AM or PM, like as far as transition between the classrooms. Cause I mean, I know how it works now, Absolutely. right? Everybody goes from their first period class to their second period class to the third period class. But how does that look, you know, in terms of cohorts, and, 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 and what are we visualizing? And so like, what would a typical student, when they, when they show up at 825, mm -hmm. where do they go? And where do they go for the next three, two periods? No, that's, that's a great question. And, and I think the thing that we have to all understand, uh, including the parents, is that we can't, we open typically at 830. Campus used to open at 745. Parents, some parents would drop kids off at 715. We can't do that anymore. We have nowhere to put kids because once we start mixing them, then the cohorts get broken down. So I'll go through the day with you. Typical, uh, typical day, you would have an AM, first, second, and third, and then a PM, first, second, and third. And say, for example, that would be a Tuesday, and then it would repeat on a Thursday. Four, five, and six AM and four, five, and six PM would be a Wednesday and then a Friday. Um, the kids would come, they would go to their class, first period, they would go straight to their class, their teacher would be waiting there for them, they couldn't go out on the quad, they can't go into the FLC, they can't go into the cafeteria, they would have to go straight to their class, class would start straight at 8.30, um, at 9.15, we have a little extra time in the first period, five minutes for announcements, at the end of that period, they have five minutes to get to their next class. They have to follow a certain pattern. They will walk on campus. So even though their class, if they go out and turn left and their class is one door over to the right, they would have to go around the building. Very typical for the schools that we've been looking at. You know, you got to have a pattern flow. The issue that come up with uh, that the cohorts weren't were in teams, okay? So we have three seventh grade teams and three eighth grade teams. 
each team leads through their own gate. So the cohorts try to stay pure. We have six gates, more than six gates, but we have six gates assigned to teams. They'll go out that gate. Um, the, the, one of the issues is going to be with some of the classes because they're mixed classes. For example, your electives, we call them exploratories. They may have kids from other teams come into makerspace or technology or band, whatever it is. And so there's a mix of cohorts there. Uh, this also happens in the advanced math classes. We don't have an advanced class on each team. We don't have enough kids for that. So kids come from different teams to that one math class. So if there were an issue, then we would have to contact Trace back and find out who was exactly exposed um, if, it, if it did happen. So that's something that we have to think about. Logistically, there's a lot of things to, to think about like that. Yes, but, but typically, a, so, so typically a child that's, that's in a first period classroom, when they go to that second period classroom, it's the same group of kids. On their team. On their team. Unless so they're going to an elective. An right, so if you were from English, right. the science class. Or an advanced yeah. math, they could be going to, or PE. We have six okay. teams and we reduced last year, if you remember, to five PE teachers. So obviously we can't, we don't have a one-to-one. -one. So there is some mixing with that. We will do, okay. um, if it's approved, this model, and we go with AMPM, then we will do our best to try to maybe shift some kids around so they're, okay. if they're in a PE class from another team and we can shift them back into their team to do that, to make it as pure as we can. But you know, you have, you have room for 16 spots and not knowing exactly how many are gonna go out to um, homeschool, this, you know, whatever name we're gonna give to it, Glee. Um, we don't know exactly what our numbers will be, but for some of the PE classes are bigger because there's only five PE teachers for 16. The rest of the uh, content areas have six for six, so. Um, I got a few questions. It, It'll, it'll, it'll be important to take a look at all the kids and kind of try to move them and make it as pure as we can. But is it gonna be 100% pure where they're not mixed with anybody from another team? I don't think that is possible. There will be some crossover. I appreciate, I appreciate that answer. Uh, it's a good question. A lot to think about for sure. Um, how is exploratory like band and choir gonna go? Is it gonna be outside? Is it gonna be inside? How is it gonna be spaced? Um, there's, you know, discussion still about that, if they're even going to play instruments and what the music program is exact, exactly going to look like. We got two incredible teachers in Ariane Aguilera and Nancy Severin who have thought about it and um, there may not be singing like we know it and there not, may not be playing instruments like we know it, um, but there will still be band and choir. And, and then Next question, how is PE gonna look? Like, are they gonna have to dress down? How are you gonna move um, the locker rooms? Are they um, gonna have lockers? Yeah, I mean, no, <laughs> they can't because we won't be able to socially right. space them out in a locker room. They're very, uh, yes, there's I, a massive <laughs> humanity in the locker room. You're asking these questions. And so, no, they probably wouldn't dress down. They would probably go straight into the class because the classes are shorter. Yeah. Typically they're 50, 52 minute classes. These are gonna be 40. And so you would lose you know, 25% of your teaching time just having them dress. <laughs> so they'll go straight out. Um, they'll have to be socially distanced, which we can do um, on a nice day out on the blacktop, not a problem. On a rainy cold day where they're inside, it's gonna be more of a problem, um, but we could probably work through that, but they wouldn't be dressing down in a locker room. Yeah. I have a question with um, with how it, I guess, with the classes change over. So I'm a student, my first class is in room 18. Mm -hmm. And so when I leave that class and go to my next class, is there another class coming into room 18? Is there gonna be time to clean it or, or are you, looking at at a teacher potentially you know going to three different classrooms in the morning and then everything is cleaned up in three different classrooms in the afternoon well well the teachers won't move 
at present, um, the kids would move. So when they get up and move, we had this discussion today. So they get up and move. If we ask those kids to clean their tables before they move, the next kid coming in might say, I wonder how well this got cleaned. So my thought was today, um, when I was talking with people about it, that the, as the class comes in, it's, there, it's cleaned by the student. Now, what role the teacher takes in that has to be figured out through negotiations and things. Do they spray the stuff and the kids wipe it down? Do the kids have wipes to wipe it down? I don't know, Lois, if you want to address that at all. But what did you see, Ron, when you researched this? Because you gave me an example of what you saw. They, they, the kids actually cleaned their desks. The kids and the teachers cleaned their desks. So obviously they had some kind of agreement mm -hmm. at, with the union and the teachers to, um, to you know, clean it. In the sense of you spray it, you know, whether you're using a little insect sprayer and you give it a shot on each desk and the kids walk in with a towel, you know, you have a paper towel or something and they wipe it down. Then the kid feels good that it was cleaned properly and they throw it away and class gets started. We have a five minute passing period. Um, is it gonna take longer? Do we need to extend that to seven minute passing period so that kids have more time to do it? Um, those are all things that can be considered once we say yes to a model and then how we would do it. But those are all questions that have been asked over and over. Do teachers have to do custodial duties? And obviously at McCaffrey, we have over 40 classes going. And so uh, we don't have the custodian, we have one day custodian to do that. So that would be an issue. What, uh, what are other districts doing? With the, with the cleaning part? Yeah, well, just, yeah. I mean, that, that was right. the part, I think, again, the students had that role of where they wiped down. Yeah. They actually did it. Yeah. They only have an hour of sanitation break and they're able to do it. We have an hour and a half built in uh -huh. based on Lois's recommendation. She had, you know, so many minutes for class to do it, three to five. And so we're figured an hour and a half should be sufficient to do it. Um, but again, it's, you know, like we, when I talk with the teachers, we can extend anything. They have a seven hour work day. We can extend and make it go a little bit longer into the day, uh, but they, just so they don't go over their seven hours, you know. So each period is projected to be how 40, long? 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Yeah. So you know, the time to aim, the PM schedules are a little off by. Yeah, the elementary school and the middle school don't match up exactly. Um, like I said, we it's a model, so we could extend it and make them 45 minute classes and things like that. But then it'll probably bump it a little bit past elementary school and it kind of pushes, it just pushes everything back five minutes. <laughs> over six periods, you get another half hour. Um, but oh. you, you can do three minutes. You know, you start doing the three minute thing, then you get the weird times. You know, your class starts at 922 instead of 920 and those kind of things. But Well, the elementary and middle schools never lined up time wise. It was no. like 8 to 230 and then 830 to 3. So, yeah, the teacher work days are the same, but the yeah. school days don't. Line up for so transportation that reasons. Should be expected, I think. Yeah. Yep. And research shows middle school uh, starting later is better for kids. I do think this is interesting because isn't the high school on a block schedule or they used to be? The high school is on a block schedule, which is a whole. Which, right, but like I'm just saying, like the transition. Because yeah, yeah. that kind of. Get in. It is. It's a big transition to what they're going to face in high school yeah. or six different classes. <laughs> much different than elementary school. So I have one more question, question I can share. So if uh, you have a child show up Tuesday, so would Monday be a, like a, a Zoom day for everybody? Yeah, it would be total asynchronous um, work, same right. as elementary school. The teacher would assign work and then they would be 
prepping, communicating, all these things that Jennifer so so then, eloquently described. So yeah. So then on Tuesday and Thursday, they'll have the first and third. So on Wednesday and Friday, will they have just the, the teacher will just assign them like homework? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why we didn't, if you go back to back day, you go say Tuesday, Wednesday, uh -huh. and they go back to back. First, second, third, Tuesday, first, second, third, Wednesday. Then Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I mean, they're five days off. Yeah. yeah. And that could be pretty disastrous. So I think the alternating days helps for sure. Questions on this? I just I have a question. It's, it's not for Mr. Raymer. It's actually for, for, for Lois, um, and it was actually posed to me in, a, in in an email from a parent. But it was just a concern about. I know we've talked about using you know did we purchase floggers for disinfecting the classrooms in the in, in, during those uh, during that gap between the, the AM and the PM. Um, the question was what exactly was the the chemical being used in it. And I think, and, and I understand, I mean, any chemicals we use in the classroom, including hand sanitizer and, and Windex, that we have to provide material safety data sheets for that. Mm -hmm. um, since we, you know, since a typical parent now can't just like walk onto campus and say, let me see your binder. Um, are we going to be able to, can, can we put that information like maybe on the district website or something that so that people can see what's being used. So yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously I know it's I, yeah, the recommendation. I, sure, I had a comparison email and asked okay. for the MSDS data sheets and oh, yeah. we emailed those to them. Um, but we can definitely put those on the website. Um, what the, the disinfectant, there's three main disinfectants that we use to clean all the schools. The one that we've really designated for the sprayers is a disinfectant called Fight Back. And it's been approved um, on the EPA list um, to use in classrooms, nurseries, um, it's it's very safe. Um, so that's what we're currently using. Um, there's two other cleaners that are also very safe on the EPA list, but um, we've chosen Fight Back because it comes pre-mixed in gallon jugs and it's very easy to pour into the backpack sprayer. We're also using that on the buses. Um, so that's what we're, we're using right now, but I definitely can put the data sheets on the website. Excellent. That would, yeah, thank you very much. I think mm -hmm. that would help. And I don't know if they use this exact one, but I know a lot of tumbling places use a similar like sprayer disinfector. So this isn't a a new thing. They've been doing they've been using yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. like other right. organizations, businesses have been using yeah. the sprayers. Yes, for a long sprayers, time. Yes. Gyms. Yeah, gyms. gyms. Yeah, the hospitals use these yeah. sprayers. Mm -hmm. So this isn't like a new thing, it's just new. It's new to us. Other districts, larger districts have used these type of cleaners for quite sure. a while. They bring the the people in from mm -hmm. the outside to do it. But we will, we'll get that on the website. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So am I free? Yeah. I was like, you want to get off the hot seat? I guess. So, um, I think we're done. Thank you, Ron. Thank, thank you. And so, um, again, what I reviewed, what we've reviewed with you at this point is um, just, again, looking at, looking at a potential timeline, looking at an A and PM schedule. And then these are some next steps. Mrs. Bach, if you could go to the next uh, slide in terms of next steps. Um, I would like to get another communication out to parent and staff members this Friday um, about our progress and some of what we reviewed with you tonight. That next week on November 2nd, 4th and 5th, we do have negotiation sessions with both our unions that um, we, as Mrs. Whitlock was talking about, that we are looking at expanded learning or child care services that we would coordinate with the reopening. Uh, Jennifer Collier, um, expanded or extended learning supervisor has been working on, on pulling that together along with Parks and Rec and Donna Whitlock's leadership. Um, pending a tentative agreement, we could be looking at then a special board meeting um, to move that along quickly um, when we reach those tentative agreements. And then uh, November, December, we want to have a district advisory committee meeting, get that going, because again, there's just um, 
it's really important to have that committee that we can get feedback and report to. And also the LCAP process is gonna start for another three year cycle. And some of like what we've already been doing with learning continuity and attendance plan, we're gonna to have to work on that along with the budget budget requirements. So we do plan to get that committee going in November and possibly meeting in December as well. And then I didn't bring it with me tonight, but we have a publication that will be online or hard copy. And what it is, is it's like a reopening guide. And it's a reopening guide that in it would have schedules, um, timelines, um, it would have one stop. Okay, here's what the commitment form looks like that parents would be signing off what our employees would be signing off, just one-stop shopping. I have a version of it, but I cannot finalize it until we've got everything bow tied. We're just about there. We're so, so close, so, so close. But again, we plan at this point to, um, and again, we're still looking at, at opening uh, really close to, uh, we will be, if, if we are looking at November 30th, um, if you could go back to that potential timeline slide, which is the second slide, please. Um, again, if we are looking at reopening the week of November 30th, that is still very close to the beginning of the second trimester. We will have started it, but it is a, a good natural uh, part to start as well. And again, just looking at what we're trying to do to not lose momentum with our cohorts that are starting it, but then getting um, our staff some quality time for them to come back and get acclimated to these procedures that we'll need to use after Thanksgiving. So again, turning it to our board president in terms of any, you know, if you'd like to discuss anything or questions about what we brought forward um, or move to public comment at this time. Well, um, maybe not the, uh, the, the safety thing, but we, you do have on the, on the uh, district website that staff student help and safety guidance for reopening schools. So yes. there is some material right now. Yes, that exactly. Can look up. Exactly. Thank you for bringing that up. And I know there's just so much right now that's happening in our lives and everyone's life right now. All along the way, we've been putting um, copies of things and then updating. That's why, again, it's not so much because they're drafts, but when we get new guidelines, and thank you for bringing that up, go right to our home page and there's the laundry list of things. But again, trying another way through a publication to get that out too. Um, uh, something I've been approached by, I think Paul has too, is the uh, people want to know, and I know some teachers have, have contacted me about like mandates, what's, ma what's going to be mandated and like what individual commitment form in our district for example all of our children will be required to wear masks all of our staff face covering um, there there can be some special needs children that we need to to adapt but those are examples we all it, it will be um, a condition of employment that every employee sign off on that it also will be a condition for our families that they sign off so, so when you say, are you saying like a, a face covering? I can because they have shields. Yes. Correct. Yes. Can the shield and, be sufficient? And Donna, can you clarify that because I know that shields can work for children that are younger, also. Yes. Um, well, currently, well, our district guidelines, and it also has in our health and safety guidelines, is we are requiring face coverings for all of our students, pre-K through grade eight, and grades pre-kinder through second grade. Um, we are recommend strongly encouraging face masks, but face shields will be acceptable. We also um, will, you know, there are children who have medical conditions or something on their health plan. They will be able to use face shields as well. We have protocol in place for classrooms, especially in some of our special education classrooms with some more of our severely handicapped children. Our staff will be, you know, have the protection as well. But facials are acceptable for our younger children and children who have, you know, medical um, issues. And I, I did want to mention, and also for our teachers who during, um, for example, assessments, small group reading instruction, where you do need to um, focus on, you know, face-to-face, -face, 
our teachers can also wear face shields that have the drape, but they do need to then put their masks back on when they're not in that instructional mode. Could you also explain what happens like with with uh, with small group instruction when you when you don't you know in situations where you know face masks don't necessarily work? What what are the other alternatives we have in small group instruction? I know that. Um, you know, when you are in a reading group, you do need to see the children's faces. You need to see them pronouncing the words. Are they pronouncing it correctly? So they will have the face shields. But also if in, our, in, our, in our classes for our younger students, um, we do have the plexiglass shields that will also be on the tables. And I know Lois um, can speak to what the, the um, recommendation is from um, our consulting firm about using as much as possible desks instead of tables. Yeah, our preschool and kinder classrooms all has tables still, but they have plexiglass that will divide the tables. That's all set up. We have also provided some, we are providing plexiglass trifolds similar to what you see right here for, for classrooms that need it. Some of our um, STC special day classes um, have, currently have these right now. The teachers that are, are volunteering and working with small cohorts have that right now. We have a big order in place right now for hopefully should come in with, within the next week that we'll be able to give some to teachers that teach the small reading groups. But it is recommended in order to social distance, it's recommended that we have the students in first and up in desk as much as possible. Um, starting with a small with AM PM schedule, you're only going to have half of your kids at a time. So a primary class will have 10 to 12 kids. And so you can social distance. You can bring them to the carpet and social distance and, and teach small group. You can have them in desk and you can teach small group as, as well. Um, but it is as much as possible, it's recommended that students stay in a desk. You know, and I know that I have, you know, some teachers have asked about the, the plexiglass that's on the tables, that they that their that their students' heads are sometimes above the plexiglass, but the students will have their face shields also. You know, for their their um, personal protection. So there's options for whatever's going to work. There best absolutely for that, for are that options, yes. and options for how they're arranged in the classroom. And some of our classrooms may only have eight to ten children in them. We will provide all of our our sites with the stickers that you see in front of you that teachers will be able to put on the carpet to social distance, so they can get kids out of the desk and go over to the carpet. Um, so we. We ordered thousands of those. <laughs> I didn't ask. Good. May I share? Thank you very much for that. May I share this? Is that um, our, our principals um, that are, are here this evening? Again, I just want to recognize everything that you are doing along with our teachers and classified staff. You are amazing. And I know that, um, you know, you've been working to support staff and also counsel and support families. And I thought this before um, you leave, because I did think that um, maybe once we get into public comment that you can stay, but I, I know also that I, I want you to think about the rest that you need to get also. But there may be some things that in light of our discussion and timeline and what we're thinking that you would like to share with the board before you go this not tonight. Is there anything that you would like to share? And if you do have something to share, if you could come up over here. I just wanted to make sure, because I know, again, there, there may be some things that came up that you want to make sure that we understand and hear collectively. Got to really, got to, if you're coming up, come up, up there, Steph, and louder, please. I just wanted uh, to let you know that we're looking forward to reopening schools and having children back on our campus so that we can equitably serve our community. Thank you. Thank you. Come on down. <laughs> Take the <a> break. <laughs> Take the break. All right. Um, I just wanted to say first that. And our teachers are giving their very best. Um, there's more preparation time than probably ever before. Uh, they need to be recognized and commended for what they're doing. We've, we've turned 
education upside down and sideways and twisted it and everything else. And all along the way, uh, teachers have been learners as well, learning new things, um, becoming experts in things that they've never done before. And I think that needs to be recognized uh, first and foremost. Um, I think that ultimately, as educators, I think that we all want to do what's best for kids. Um, and not just what's best for them academically, because we know that being in school uh, physically is what's best for them academically. I don't think that there's any argument really against that. Uh, I think we also uh, want to consider the things beyond the academics that schools bring, uh, the, the experiences that, that students get while they're in school. Uh, some could argue that those experiences are even more valuable than the academics that come with the school. So I think first and foremost, you know, as a, as a principal and as an educator, you know, we want to do what's best for kids. We want to be safe. And we have the, the safety guidelines and, and practices in place. Um, we want to bring the kids back. We want them back, you know, as soon as we can, safely. And we, we just know across the board that that's what's best for kids. Um, and, you know, I think as long as, you know, we understand that students, families, and even staff members have individual needs, uh, that may preclude or prevent them from returning. We have to uh, understand that without judgment and understand that everybody has a, a different situation and um, respect those uh, decisions as well. Uh, but ultimately, when we're looking at our, our students and the families, the feedback overwhelmingly you know, has been from them that they want their kids back uh, in school. The kids overwhelmingly and want to come back to school. So I think that that's kind of, you know, what we're trying to figure out is all the, the details about how to, how to bring them back, how to bring them back safely. And, uh, you know, hopefully in the city, in the county, in the nation, you know, numbers are, are in, a, in a place where we can do that and we can continue to do that. I think that's what we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And again, principals, we can thank you for being here this evening. And again, certainly welcome to stay. Um, but again, if, if you need to go to be ready for tomorrow, you can as well. Thank you so much. Okay. I think that we are ready for public comment because we have about, my calculations were correct, about two hours of public comment. So we should probably get started. <laughs> so, Claudia, Claudia, Claudia uh, can we take a two minute break just to make sure that we are ready to go with public comment and those that can't stay with us? Okay, good night. Thank you. And we'll see you now. Yes, yes I, so I, I need to two minutes. Maybe, 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 maybe,
go in here and do this and then do because I'm monitoring this thing problem.
Karen. Uh, okay. We're live. We're live. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. We will start with um, the emails that were emailed in. Just for there, public comment. Yes. Very good. And and uh, yes, we'll go ahead and start with emails. And Mrs. Bach is going to start. And then once Mrs. Bach finishes, um, I may be reading some of the emails as well. Mrs. Bach, if you would start, please. Yes, the first email is from Danielle Goldberg. It starts, in the past, I have read my own statement to the board. Tonight, I was afraid I would not be able to do so without crying. And those of you that know me well know I am not one easily brought to tears. I will leave it to other teachers and parents to, once again, point out the sheer lunacy of bringing our kids and staff back in the middle of what is forecast to be the worst four months of this pandemic, all while not having in place rapid test results and effective contact tracing or any safe plan for how the kids even use the bathroom. But I am speaking for my 18 six-year-olds and that is what has me choked up. I think of my 18 students who have had almost 100% attendance during this trimester. I think of my little girls who are safe at home with their blankies and stuffies, and my little boys who need to get up and wiggle, pushing further through our math curriculum than I have ever gotten before. I think of them in their individualized ELD and reading groups making astounding progress. I think of our Friday art that goes with the paragraphs we write every week. I think of our pet parades, sharing, and scavenger hunts that bring smiles to their faces. And then I think of what, it, what it's going to look like if we go back to school. All of the above will be gone. No more seeing their teachers and peers' faces. They won't see some of their peers at all. No more comforting stuffies. No more getting up to get out their wiggles. Certainly no more small group instruction. No recess or lunch. They will sit apart from all their peers and myself. And I may even look frightening to them with all the PPE I'll be wearing. They will be unable to get up, unable to socialize, unable to receive the individualized learning they are used to. I foresee potty accidents because going to the bathroom is already a little scary for a first grader, but under these circumstances, it will be terrifying. We will most likely lose an hour of instruction each day just with the logistics of coming and going. And on a personal note, it's going to break my heart not to be able to get close enough to comfort a scared child. I don't feel parents were, in good faith, informed about what this truly looks like for their kids. Once they realize what it is, I predict attendance will decline rapidly. Declining attendance combined with a lack of small group instruction and a pervasive feeling of unease, if not fear, will cost us everything we have gained this trimester. Some districts have not provided equitably for their students in terms of technology. We have, and I believe that is why we have seen the great academic process, progress that we have this trimester. Please don't be blinded by the minority of vocal people who want to take away these successes from my kids and their parents. Please explain to us what exactly are we gaining from going back? The ability for this board to say they did so when no other district in Sacramento County has? Is this the hill that you are willing to die on? Or more accurately, is this the hill you wish students and staff to potentially die on? There is no wishing away COVID, no good choice, but distance learning has been proven to be the best alternative to normal that we could all hope for. Thank you, Danielle Goldberg. The second letter is from Emily Derman. My name is Emily Derman and I have been a special education teacher at McCaffrey Middle School for five years. Thank you for the opportunity to express my concerns when it comes to opening the schools on November 17th. We are being asked to return to this year for a total of 19 days during the time of year when family and friends spend more time together than usual and some will be traveling out of the state or out of the country. Though our students' families will try to maintain all the recommended precautions, the reality is that the risk of COVID spreading during these two months is increased, especially with its already being cold and flu season. The in-school, out-of-school shifts leave no time for quarantining, 
isolating for safety, I am concerned as to what will happen in January when the county likely returns to a higher risk color level. I wonder what good will we have accomplished with these 19 days. With the proposed hybrid schedule, students would actually receive less direct instruction with teachers and be expected to complete more independent work. They would only be on campus two days a week for a few hours. Students would be required to wear masks, socially distance, and school would not be normal. I am not sure that students and their parents understand that the things they are looking forward to, meeting with friends, lunch socialization, hands-on materials, lab experiments, piano, et cetera, will not be available. There will, be, there will be even more frustration with possible elective changes due to the new guidelines for classroom safety and scheduling. The students will be switching classrooms, exposing themselves to new students who have likewise been exposed to other students all through the day. The five minutes of sanitation does not seem sufficient for all this. A student could potentially be exposed to 15 different students each period change. On a professional level, my students have been more present and have been performing better with the virtual model. I have over 95% of my students participating daily and my students have an average GPA of 3.0. I am able to spend more one-on-one -on -one with my students and provide the services they need. Parents have commented in IEPs that this way of learning is better for their students these 19 days will be a disjointed experience for them, losing all sense of continuity. On a personal level, my mother has been undergoing radiation and chemotherapy and is therefore very immune compromised. With two daughters under school age, it has been very difficult to maintain safe margins to see my mother at all. Opening school with this schedule would make it impossible for me. Never once in my 12 years of teaching have I ever thought I would be torn between being the sole provider for my family and being a supportive, dedicated daughter. Returning to the school setting in order to provide food, insurance, and support for my children would mean I could not spend the time with my mother that she has remaining to her. This is an unbearable choice to have to make. Okay. Number three is from Lizette Avalos. My name is Lizette Avalos. I have two children that attend school at the Galt Unified School District. I have to say that I am extremely shocked that our school district would consider transitioning back to school this year. Cases of COVID continue to rise and by opening the schools, we are allowing for the potential spread of the virus to our vulnerable family members and community. I know we have been assured that the school district is taking safety precautions. However, we are in the middle of flu cold season. I don't understand how we can pull children from distance learning to only go back to school for a couple of hours each week. Transitioning to online learning has been a difficult task, but now that parents, teachers, and students have adjusted, it does not benefit to readjust to a new educational system. One of the concerns is that with the holidays approaching, this means that the students are going to be using this new learning system for a short period of time. Children will not be able to socialize with their classmates, friends, and will have to follow strict COVID regulations. While at home, they do not have to wear a mask and are able to Zoom with classmates without precautions. All the neighboring school districts, for example, Elk Grove Unified School District, are not considering transitioning until the new year, 2021. If schools are not going to be able to open full time, I strongly urge the school district to remain closed and continue distance learning. I hope Galt Joint Union School District is taking into consider consideration all the concerns mentioned. Sincere sincerely, Lizette Avalos. Okay. The next number four is from Krista Dunkel the, and the third grade team at Greer Elementary School. Dear district leadership team, we are writing this letter to express concerns we have as educators about returning to school in November. We are asking that you reconsider waiting until January to begin the reopening process. Due to the limit of 450 words for public comment, we have chosen to send our letter over email 
as we feel our concerns can't be clearly conveyed in that word limit. To begin, we are less than a month from the proposed date of reopening. As it stands, we as educators have not been given anything more than the guidelines published on the website and through district email. It is entirely possible that you have developed a more in-depth document with more specific protocols that we aren't aware of. The guidelines as they stand are a broad overview of what safety protocols may look like in the classroom and on campus. However, there is a lot missing and we don't feel that we have a clear picture of what this would look like on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure everyone's safety. For instance, what would the school arrival look like? In the guidelines, it states that arrivals would be staggered if possible. Some questions we have from just this one statement include, if arrivals are staggered, is that by grade level or by family? How much time would be given between each arrival window? It only states if possible. If that is not possible, what does that look like to again ensure everyone is safe? This again is only from one piece of the guidelines. There are many more questions we have in regards to implementing a safe return to campus. This return to campus will be unlike any first day back on campus that we have experienced before. If we are unclear on what is expected, how can we be asked to begin planning for the return of learners with such a short amount of time? We begin every school year with training our learners on our school and classroom procedures. If we don't know what the safety measures and protocols will be, how can we break it down into procedures in order to train students to be safe while on campus? Just like academic routines support efficiency, well-known safety procedures will can become routines that help us navigate these uncertain times. In a time of so much uncertainty, it is important to be specific, specific where we can. <coughs> Excuse me. 30 seconds. Wait. <laughs> Waiting until January will give us time as, as a district to come up with a clear plan to implement. As you can imagine, these procedures take some time to become routines. In past years, we have had to retrain learners on procedures after each break in our instruction. We will spend most, of, most, if not all, of our first week back on campus teaching learners these new procedures, only to have to retrain them after Thanksgiving break. This will again need to happen after winter break. Normally, the learners have had multiple months before these breaks to internalize these routines. These will be brand new procedures that they won't fall as easily back into as they have in the past. With reduced hours of in-person instruction, that means a majority of our instruction between now and January will be spent on procedures. Moving the return to campus back to January would bypass this concern of instruction loss. Thank you for listening to and considering our concerns. The third grade team <coughs> at Vernon E. Greer. <coughs> Why it's, it's, it's a Karen shower. Would you like me to keep reading? If you would start at number five and I'll, and then I'll take, I'll take it over again, Karen, that would be great. Okay. All right. You know what, how about if I do, um, how about if I do the next, um, next three? I'll do the next three. Okay, here we go. And um, here's, here's the next one. Um, this is from Jennifer Johnson. Hello, I know you must be so incredibly busy and you are being tasked with making very difficult decisions. So I will try not to take up much of your time. I've completed the survey for both of my children. And the thing that keeps worrying me is the idea of them having to possibly switch teachers. Switch teachers a third of the way through the school year. Switch, switch teachers during the most difficult year of their young lives. Switch teachers when everything is constantly changing or glitching or crashing and their teachers are the only constant that they have had. I know that there are children that want to stay home and they need to have a teacher, but I selfishly don't want that to come at the cost of my child's education, peace of mind or comfort in the classroom. My children love their teachers. They know what to expect from them and what they can expect from their teacher. They are both horrified at the idea of losing their teachers. I'm begging you to find another way. Um, Scarlett and Hunter are begging you too. Thank you for all your hard work. 
Sincerely, Jennifer Johnson. The next uh, email uh, comment, comment is from Karen Gum, first grade teacher, Greer Elementary School. Good evening, Gall Elementary School Board. I want to express my thoughts and feelings regarding our transition to on-campus learning for the children in our school district. Students need to be taught in person to provide the best opportunity for them to transition once again to actual learners. I cannot speak for every teacher in this district, but I know from my experience as a first grade teacher, online learning is not allowing my class to meet their fullest potential. As we look to schools all over the nation and even the world, data has shown we can safely return to in-person learning. I feel strongly every teacher is an essential employee. I want my students back in my classroom with me now so I can actually teach to my fullest potential. I urge the school board to do whatever is necessary to open up fully in person five days a week. Sincerely, Karen Gum, first grade teacher, Greer Elementary School. Quiet, I'll do one more. Um, this, is, oh. this is an email um, from Kathleen Pletcher on behalf of uh, Greer TKK teachers. Um, these are Greer TKK distance learning questions for shared classrooms. Number one, how will the rooms, sinks, bathrooms, plexiglass tables, handles be thoroughly cleaned in 15 minutes without cohort? Number two, what will the quality of education be like in TKK for 90 minutes each cohort? Number three, currently the plexiglass and the tables do not address the health guidelines of six feet apart. The plexiglass of students sitting side by side like little cubbies. The students' hands and paper will be protected from contamination, but their heads and bodies will be outside of the plexiglass. How will we be able to safely, dis to safely distance the students? Number four, TKK is very hands-on in the envir in, on environment. What will the age-appropriate guidelines be in order for us to use all of our classroom materials, math manipulatives, toys, dramatic play area, books, playground equipment and structures, class tools? Number five, music and movement are essential for learning in TKK. According to the guidelines, singing must be done outside. How will we be able to keep young children in a socially distant spot for 90 minutes without these important activities? Number six, how can we keep children from playing on the playground and from playing with each other? Seven, what is the rush to come back during the flu and holiday season? Families will be gathering and may or may not be following the COVID-19 guidelines. Many families travel out of state and others out of the country. How can we track the virus and ensure everyone's safety? Number eight, we have limited entrances and exits. Multiple classes will be arriving and departing at the same time. What will arrivals and dismissals look like? Where will students that are not picked up be on time be waiting? Number nine, how will children's social emotional well-being be addressed? How can we how can we be caring teachers? How will we comfort a sad crying child, runaway child? Typically, our teaching partners or teaching assistants are available to help us with these situations. Ten, how will COVID and flu symptoms in children be distinguished? Are children going to be tested? 11, what will be the disinfecting process between each student's use of the restroom during class time? Many of our students are still learning how to use the restroom properly. Who is going to disinfect the restroom between uses? For example, many of the little boys can urinate on the toilet seat and or floor. This is an everyday occurrence in the TKK world. Thank you, Greer TKK teachers. Mrs. Bach, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Schauer. The next comment is from Lori Corona, eighth grade teacher, at, science teacher at McCaffrey Middle School. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak regarding reopening our schools. My name is Lori Corona, and this is my 21st year teaching middle school in Galt. More than anything, I want to be back at school with my students. As a parent of a second grader myself, I understand the frustration parents have with distance learning and agree that students need to be with their teachers. According to my current grade book, when students are with me on Zoom, they complete 85% of their work, a B grade, while on their own, they complete only 65% of their work, a D grade. Clearly, being with their teacher is a benefit, even in distance learning. Unfortunately, returning to middle, 
Returning middle school students at this time will not relieve this frustration. In fact, this frustration will only increase because in the middle school hybrid model, time with their teachers is actually reduced. And I am not sure parents are aware of this. In middle school, students will only see me twice a week for a total of 80 minutes, instead of the current five days a week for a total of 150 minutes. The time they will be with me is essentially cut in half. Students will not benefit from being with their teachers because they will be with their teachers less. They will spend more time in front of their computers at home, alone, with no opportunity to meet with their teacher for help during office hours. Do parents realize this? I am not sure this information was shared with middle school parents before they were asked to fill out a recent survey. Speaking of informing parents, before the recent survey, were parents informed that middle school students will be switching classes, that in every class they will be exposed to a new group of students, that the so-called cohort for middle school is well over the 16 bodies allowed in elementary classes due to the switching of classes and the fact that students will be exposed to multiple middle school teams in their elective and PE classes? Have parents been made aware of these health and safety risks at the middle school so they can make an informed decision about whether it is worth returning for less teacher time? I urge you to slow our return until we are able to safely have middle school students on campus for more teacher time, not less. For these reasons, multiple school districts in the area, such as our neighbor Elk Grove, are planning to return middle school students in January or later. And I urge you to do the same. Respectfully, Lori Corona. The next letter is from Jennifer Waters. The school board, language arts um, teacher, grade seven. The school board is forced tonight to make life and death decisions. If there is a reasonable chance that any student or teacher will contract a highly contagious disease, the responsible decision is not to put our children and staff in those conditions. With 0% of students on campus, one of our school sites was forced to close due to COVID-19 for 10 days earlier this year, before flu season started. The safety protocols in place are not enough to protect us. This is a matter of reasonable risk management. The school district cannot afford the risks. You cannot reasonably justify asking for this level of risk from the teachers, staff, parents, and students. According to the CDC, community exposure is individual who has had close contact within six feet for a total of 15 minutes or more. Note, this is irrespective of whether the person with COVID-19 or the contact was wearing a mask or whether the contact was wearing respiratory personnel protective equipment. Middle school teachers have been asked to work, one, with daily exposure to 70 or more students per day, two, five minutes passing periods to clean, disinfect, and go to the bathroom, three, 50% of the campus mixing within those five minutes, over 350 people, students are exposed to before and after school and during passing periods. This is not a reasonable expectation of safety for staff or students. As a school board, you would rather face lawsuits from parents over missed educational opportunities than a wrongful death lawsuit. If there is a reasonable chance that students or staff can contract the disease, which has infected over 8 million people in the US and killed over 225,000, then the board should put safety first and delay opening until January. Thank you, Jennifer Waters, tenure teacher in Galt Joint Union Elementary School District. <clears throat> the next letter, number 10, is from Sage Coral, a very concerned parent, to whom it may concern I am writing this email in hopes that I can share some of my concerns that have arose since the first conversation um, was started about our children returning to campus. I was one of the parents that was very excited about the idea that our children could return to learning at their schools. I filled out the survey with great excitement, again, with the idea that our children could return to some normalcy in their lives, including the importance of going to school. 
As, as it has seemed to turn out, boy, was I misled. The survey in no way explained what type of mandates our children would be under if and when they were to return to school. I do believe that if these scenarios were forthcoming to parents, a lot of the surveys would have come back differently. I know mine would. I have been in the education system for over 20 years teaching and coaching, and I am heartbroken to see and hear how this return to campus has been handled. In what seems to be a rush to get our children back on campus, we are doing damage to them more than what we are doing to help them with their education. What I mean by this is by bringing them into campus, keeping them distance from their friends and teachers, not allowing them to leave their desks and forcing them to wear a mask, all of these things combined is cruel and psychologically damaging. Again, since this wasn't forthcoming in your survey, the answers you received were obviously skewed. I understand that some parents are struggling trying to work and teach their children from home and they may need to send their children back to campus, but why the secrecy? Why not come out in the beginning and be upfront with what the conditions would be so that parents could make the most informed decision? What now for those parents who don't want to see their children subjected to this kind of thing? Now, if we want to keep them home, we have to stop working and help teach them under an independent study system. Why is there no option for a live stream? My child could be at home in the place they can get up and move around and get fresh air and still learn like the other students. But this isn't an option. Why not? Why the rush to get back on campus? Why can't we wait until January like the majority of other school districts are doing? I can't even get back on my campus until January per the Los Rios School District. There just seems to be a lot, of more, a lot more questions than answers right now, and I don't think this is the time to rush back to anything. Distance learning is challenging. Distance teaching is challenging. I know because I am doing that now, but it seems like a better option than what we are about to subject our children to. I feel like I have no other option than to pull my children out of the district and put them in a private school. This decision breaks my heart but I need to do what is best for my children during this challenging time. I really do hope you would reconsider opening school back in this manner before you have better options for our children. Sincerely, Coral Sage, a very concerned parent. The last email is from Kelly Volchik, um, district curriculum coach. My greatest concern about returning to the hybrid model being currently discussed is the loss of instructional minutes. I currently have 150 minutes per week to deliver live instruction. Granted, it is over Zoom, which has some inherent barriers. Still, we have worked feverishly these past few months to alleviate those barriers and provide quality instruction for those students who participate. Moving to in-person classroom instruction is is exciting in that I will be able to know that the delivery of instruction is clear and students will have direct access to me for questions and clarifications. Unfortunately, I am now reduced to 80 minutes per week of live instruction. Additionally, given the challenge of students completing work independent, independently, the amount of learning that will happen with this new setup will be drastically reduced. The benefits of returning to in-person school under these circumstances is present, but quite slight. Students will only be on campus a few hours per day. It will not have the freedom to move around or socialize. At the same time, the amount of work that they will have to complete independently will almost double. In most ways, this becomes a lose-lose for students academically. Kelly Volchik, district curriculum coach. That, that's the end of the email comments. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mrs. Locke. I, I was going to share, this is a uh, Karen Shower, um, that uh, I was going to segue to our, our director of, of curriculum here to segue to public comment. Um, okay. I, I wanted to say before I do that, that uh, what we had done um, prior to the, uh, be, before we began the action items 
is that we had asked uh, the public who is joining us tonight to indicate that um, they were providing public comment in addition to those who already had contacted Quai. So we are no longer accepting public comment for this. We're going to go with what we have. And at the same time, there may be uh, some public comment where people may have decided based on what they hear in previous public comment by email or what they've heard that they no longer want to make public comment. And so they can, they are able to cancel that as well. But I think indicating that by, by not raising their hand, they can unraise their hand. So um, Claudia Del Toro Anguiano, I, I think there were some other things that you wanted to add. Thank you, Dr. Schauer. So at this time we have 35, uh, 35 people who have signed up to speak. Uh, we'll ask the public to I want to remind the, the people that are speaking that you have three minutes. You will be given a 30 second warning that um, that time might be up soon. So with that, I think we will go ahead and start with our first public comment. Um, Mrs. Box, do we have a name for the first one? Yes, our first public comment is from Heidi Freeman. Heidi, um, we're going to go ahead and unmute you now. You may need to unmute your device also. Good evening, board members. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, my name is Heidi Friedman and I'm a special education teacher at McCaffrey Middle School. I'm writing to you both as a concerned citizen and as an employee of the district. I have spent hours in meetings as we've tried to figure out the best way to serve our students. This year has obviously been trying on everyone as a teacher with uh, students with special needs. I'm starting my 32nd year of teaching and I feel like I'm a first year teacher. I heard at the last board meeting, um, we're asking why teachers aren't considered essential workers. As a teacher, I had to relearn how to teach. I'm a teacher that is bringing her class as a small cohort back. In fact, I have eight out of my student, eight out of nine of my students that have come back. I have mixed emotions, but feel that coming back with nine students in one classroom is much safer than 400 or 800 students with teachers on campus moving classroom to classroom and being considered a cohort. I love teaching and I want what is best for my students, but I don't want the district to put us in a position of not being safe because of the strange need to push us to be open without a plan that is clear and safe. I have an option right now that if things don't go well, or if we aren't able to keep the environment safe, that I can stop the cohort. And I am, if the district, goes forward with a plan that looks good on paper and it doesn't work in reality, we will be stuck with it. We are, we see numbers going up as, um, as the wave of COVID is once again heading our way. And I'm not sure how we see the board and the district sees that there is a benefit to students learning with the schedules that we have been providing, that we are providing that have less face time with teachers. I don't understand how the district can feel good about a schedule that provide that about uh, parents can feel good about sending their children back when there's not gonna be a normal. There's no playing with friends, eating in the cafeteria with friends, no group work, no hugs, no pats, no high fives. We know that the holidays are coming and we know families are gonna travel. It is not the time to disrupt the way of learning that has finally kind of become familiar and doable. And I think that it is much better than the AB or AM PM schedules that we have put forward. Uh, my other concern is middle school. It doesn't function the same as elementary and somehow we always get put into an elementary schedule. It has become increasingly clear that trying to put a schedule together for middle school is almost impossible. The makeup and scheduling of the middle school is very complex and ideally after the holidays, maybe we'll have a little bit more time to figure things out. Choir, band, technology, AVID are options that children need. And right now with the new schedules, it's almost impossible to make them part of it. I sincerely ask the district to really look at the aspects of pushing students uh, uh, to go back. It is really, is it really in their best interest to try to get everything into place without a clear plan by November is ridiculous. Please listen to your staff and have a clear survey for parents that share the true vision of what their students face. Thank you for your time. I apologize. Yes, the next public comment is from Ryan Montgomery. Thank you, Mrs. Vossel. Need 
Ten seconds to to find the next public comment. And it looks like he may be under Kerry Montgomery. Thank there you. we go. Are you there? I'm going to speak for my husband because he's spoken many times before in the past and I'll just take over for him. Um, my name is Carrie Montgomery and I'm addressing you as a concerned parent and district employee. I have a kindergartner and fourth grader in our district and this is my 15th year as a teacher at McCaffrey Middle School. Like many others, I have serious concerns about the reopening of our schools specifically the communication and transparency of information to families and employees in regards to the district's plan for reopening. I feel the latest parent and employee surveys were vague and did not adequately provide enough information to allow families and employees to make informed decisions. How can parents and employees answer questions about returning to school when they are not given any information or details about what going back to school will look like. No recess, no assemblies, no field trips, no clubs, no lunch. Students still working on Chromebooks while at school. As a parent and educator, there is nothing I want more than to have my children and all students back in school, but not under these conditions. I do not believe distance learning is what is best for most students, most families, or most employees. However, my primary concern with the potential reopening plan is that all students will receive less live instructional minutes each week. Middle school students will no longer have daily contact with their teachers and there will be very few, if any, opportunities for small group instruction and help. Will the district ensure that families with multiple children will be on the same AM PM schedule? If we are opening the schools, it should be a step forward, not backwards. Another major concern of mine is how McCaffrey will reopen without changing the schedules of the majority of students. According to the district health and safety guidelines and CDC, students will be grouped in cohorts and will not mix with other cohorts. How many students are considered a cohort? How many total people, students and adults could be grouped together? Middle school students have six teachers. We are teamed by course subjects, but many PE and elective teachers have more than 32 students in a class. They teach both grade levels and students from all teams. How will the district determine which students get to stay in their PE elective in any core classes that they ha that have over 32 students? How will the district explain to students that they will have to be reassigned to different teachers, class periods, or electives? My final concern is about the proposed district childcare. What is the plan? Who will be caring for the children? What training qualifications and experience do the caregivers have? Can you ensure students will have individualized academic support to complete asynchronous work? Will the caregivers be licensed daycare providers or credentialed teachers? Will siblings be together? When can parents expect answers? Board of trustees, our children are our community's greatest asset. I strongly believe schools need to open, but the reopening needs to be for the benefit of all students. I urge you to ask hard questions and demand more details before you approve the district's reopening plan. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Carrie. Our next comment is from Ariana Aguilera. And I believe, here you go. Hello, thank you for once again, allowing me to speak in front of you. I'm Ariane Aguilera. I've been a music teacher in our district since 2003. Um, and I wanted to add my voice to all of the others that are concerned about coming back to in-person learning um, on the schedule that has been proposed. Um, it, just like everyone else, I'm very concerned about the number of instructional minutes. As an exploratory teacher at McCaffrey, I'm also concerned that all of my classes have students from multiple teams. My, I have two piano classes, one has 35 students in it, and every single one of the six teams on the McCaffrey campus are represented in that class. So there will be a mixing of cohorts or we're going to have to reschedule students and say, oh, well, you are the unlucky one. You don't get your 
um, chosen exploratory anymore. If we have to do that to students, how is that helpful to them? For them to go back to school when they have to stay socially distanced and wear a mask and go straight from walking in the gate to their desk. And on top of that, they might lose the one class that they had a choice in that they got to pick. That could be just devastating and really hurt the engagement of our students in the learning process. Exploratories are not extras. They are what keeps students interested in school and keeps students going. Uh, I did a little research this week trying to figure out what other Sacramento school districts are doing. And I found both uh, Elk Grove Unified, as been mentioned, also San Juan Unified, Folsom Cordova, Twin Rivers, and Center Unified all have posted dates for returning to school, especially for middle school, in January. I couldn't find any Sacramento County middle school who had a posted date to return before January. I'm very concerned about families traveling and out of the area, out of the state, out of the country and having the potential for bringing COVID back and then having all these mixing cohorts, especially at the middle school. So I would ask you to please reconsider this plan and please consider delaying until January like the other Sacramento County school districts. Thank you. Thank you, Ariana. Our next comment is from Joanna Nelson. Hi, good evening. Can everyone hear me? Just wanna make sure. Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Thank you. My name is Joanna Nelson and this is my 21st year teaching middle school in golf. I really look forward to getting back into my classroom and teaching my seventh and eighth grade students in person. However, I'm here to ask you, the school board and Dr. Shower, two very important to think about two very important components before reopening our middle school. First, the massive scheduling changes that will impact all 719 students. For instance, I teach two classes, seventh grade AVID, a college readiness pathway elective, and three classes of eighth grade social studies. My two classes, classes of seventh grade AVID, 42 students may have to be reassigned to another teacher and possibly forced to enroll in a different elective. My AVID students applied for this elective and were selected to be in my class. I have spent the last 10 weeks bonding, bonding and fostering a relationship with all of my students. And now with the rush to reopen under current hybrid plans, all teachers at, and students at McCaffrey will have to hit the restart button. Another detail I'm just asking you to consider is the amount of actual teaching time that will be lost. Under either hybrid plan, the teaching time at McCaffrey will be cut in half for our middle school students. McCaffrey students will go from receiving 180 minutes of live instruction five days a week that I see them to four one half days of instruction. Students will be left on their own at home to figure things out for the equivalent of three days a week. I'm well, I'm well aware of that teaching through Zoom is far not an ideal situation, but I do ask you to consider the teacher contact time that drastically will be cut and the nightmare scheduling situation that will occur at McCaffrey. Thank you for listening. And I hope you take all the facts into consideration. Thank you, Joanna. Our next comment is from Christina Cesarelli. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to address the board and cabinet. My name is Christina Ceccarelli and this is my 10th year teaching at McCaffrey Middle School. I believe the elementary district has not been transparent with the families of Galt about the circumstances and consequences of hybrid learning at McCaffrey. Under tier two hybrid, only 50% of our students can be on campus at any time. With the proposed AM PM schedule, the students will not be grouped in small cohorts like elementary. In fact, they won't be in any sort of cohort at all, moving through six classrooms a week with nearly 100 individual contacts. In order for students to remain in their six classes without schedule and teacher changes, this is the only feasible way presented so far. However, it does increase the risk of spreading COVID. With the proposed hybrid model, students will be on campus four half days a week, but there will be no lunch break, no playing games on the basketball courts or fields, no socializing with friends, no lunchtime activities, no hanging out in the quad, and they will be completely on their own three days a week for asynchronous learning. 
As long as the district and school board insist on reopening McCaffrey in tier two red, there is no safe way to return children to campus safely with any kind of normalcy. We have made the best of a bad situation with the current model of distance learning at McCaffrey. I am able to Zoom with all 130 of my students daily for 30 minutes at a time. In the afternoons from 1.15 until 3 p.m. every day is asynchronous time. I, as well as our other teachers, are available to Zoom with individual students who need help or to provide differentiated instruction for our high needs learners. Kids can drop in and get one-on-one -on -one time with their teacher. A few kids show up every afternoon to do their work with me. We have spent 10 weeks strengthening social and emotional connections and learning and growing together. With the hybrid model, instead of getting 150 minutes of live instruction with me as they currently do in distance learning, I will see my classes twice a week for a mere 80 minutes. This is nearly half of the face-to-face -face time kids get in distance learning. And I'd also like to remind you that prior to COVID, I spent 260 minutes a week with every student. And now we're down to 80. Not only is live instruction reduced, but students will also be assigned the equivalent of three days of independent instruction. I will not be able to Zoom with them for help because I will be teaching the other group of kids in person. These are the reasons why nearly every other public school district in Sacramento County has push the reopening of middle and high schools back into at least January with the hope of to moving to tier three orange level. Once we are orange, 100% of students can be back on campus five days a week. I urge the school board and the community to consider how the requirements of tier two hybrid learning will impact the learning experience of the children in Galt. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Christina. Our next public comment is from Christina Lowry. Thank you for the opportunity to address the board, superintendent, and cabinet members this evening. My name is Christina Lowry, and I'm an eighth grade social studies teacher at McCaffrey Middle School. For three of you sitting on the board, I've been your children's teacher and or I've taken them on the annual trip to Washington, D.C., from personal experience, you know my dedication to my profession, you know how much I care for my students, and you know how much I value the relationships that I've made with your children and thousands of others over the past 24 years teaching in this district. Just as you desire seeing children back in the classroom, so do I and every one of the teachers speaking here tonight. But we must do it with thoughtful and not rushed measures, keeping the health and safety in mind of the students and employees and the loss of live instructional minutes in this blended learning model. Recognizing that middle school is an entirely different concern is paramount to this reopening plan. The health and safety guidelines stress that students must move in cohorts to decrease exposure. In elementary to say that a co cohort of students is 20 to 30 was seeing half in the morning, half in the afternoon is manageable, but what is a cohort of middle school students? the 150 that each middle school teacher serves, making 75 different contacts in a day with students switching from class to class. I'm simply asking that we keep this in mind when planning a strategic return to school as it will affect rescheduling of potentially hundreds of students. Because of this issue, many school districts are having middle schoolers as well as high school students continue on distance learning because of the inability to create smaller cohorts and prevent hundreds of students from being quarantined if someone tests positive for COVID. Additionally, we must keep in mind the decreased synchronous instructional time that students will receive in middle school should we return under this proposed blending, blended learning model. Currently, middle school students receive 180 minutes per day of live instruction five days per week with all six of their teachers on Zoom. This accounts for 900 minutes per school week. Under an AMPM model, students will only receive 120 minutes per day of live instruction in three classes only, which results in a total of 480 minutes per week of live instruction. We are decreasing their live contact with the teacher by nearly 50%. Because students are only going half days, they are on their own to do assignments equivalent to three of the five days without the ability to meet their teachers during daily office hours like we currently have now. I love my students and I want the best for them, but decreasing their educational minutes with me, just seeing them two days a week, just for the sake of going to class for two and a half hours a day is not in their best interest or beneficial to their academic success. 
Please keep an open mind to all the comments you hear tonight and understand there isn't always a one size fits all solution. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Christina. Our next comment is from Monica Brixley. Hi, good evening. My name is Monica Brixley and I have two children in the district. I know distance learning has its limitations and none of us expected it would last this long. Fortunately, my children are thriving this school year. They have wonderful teachers. They have a consistent schedule and have developed a stable routine. They are also learning resiliency, adaptability, and grace, skills that they will carry with them for life. Although we are doing well with distance learning, I understand that those who are struggling. I know many parents surveyed supported the reopening of our schools with safety protocols in place. I was one of those parents. But when I completed that survey, I had assumed that that, that would happen when it was most appropriate to do so, and that it wouldn't negatively impact my children educationally, socially, and mentally more than this past year already has. Currently, my fifth grader is receiving over 21 hours of instruction a week. My seventh grader is receiving 15 hours. All of their teachers are also available after class via Zoom for, for help and support. Under the two hybrid plans that the district has proposed, instructional time will drop between eight and 10 hours a week, two between eight and 10 hours a week. Reading groups will be gone and I cannot fathom how the middle school is going to fit six classes into such a short period of time, all while presumably disinfecting between classes and policing hundreds of middle school students to distance from their friends and keep their masks on. There will be no more Zoom instruction while off campus, leaving my children working independently at home for the majority of the week. I know some children have no support at home and even a little school is helpful. I would love to see those students included in the small group instruction that has already begun at our school sites for students with high needs. But for a large portion of students, in addition to the loss of instructional time, there will be little educational or social emotional benefits to returning to school so soon as they will also be in, unable to socialize, play, or even give their teacher and friends a hug due to the necessary restrictions. Further, what happens when students develop a fever, cough, or sore throat, as many inevitably will? Last Friday, my daughter became sick. The only place that would see her was the ER. She had to have very uncomfortable COVID tests and strep tests done. Thankfully, she only had strep and began antibiotics right away because we still haven't received the result of her COVID test. Fully opening in the midst of the holidays, when many families will be traveling out of state to visit family, will increase the risk of having to quickly return to distance learning disrupting routines and probably heightening anxiety. I absolutely do not wanna see my children yo-yoed back and forth between in-person and distance learning if the chances of that happening can be reduced or eliminated. I know that the district and the board have difficult decisions to make and are bound by current health conditions and safety requirements, but are the proposed plans of returning to school in such a restricted capacity benefiting our children? I would like to strongly urge the board and the district to wait to fully reopen our schools until a time that students can receive at a minimum the same instructional time as they are receiving now, availability of rapid testing for students with symptoms, and after the bulk of the flu season has passed in order I don't know. Um, Monica, are you still there? I, I just realized I was muted and I don't know where I got muted. Oh, just about 30 seconds prior. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was fully opening all this. Did I already say in the midst of the holidays? Yes. Okay. I, I know the district has difficult decisions to make. I would like to strongly urge the board and the district to wait to fully reopen our schools until a time that students can receive at a minimum the same instructional time as they are receiving now, availability of rapid testing for students with symptoms, and after the bulk of the flu season is passed in order to reduce the prevalence of confusing symptoms and absent days that currently during distance learning don't have to be missed for a sniffle or a cough. If we've made it this far, please consider the costs of not waiting a little bit longer. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Monica. Our next comment is from Brenda Crozier. However, we have two Brendas on the list with the last name present, so we're going to try the first one. And it doesn't look like she. Mm 
Just, just a moment. Brenda, would you please try speaking now? She's muted. Brenda, if you're on your device, may be muted. Okay, we're gonna bypass Brenda. Brenda, if you still want to comment, please raise your hand and we'll, give, we'll come back to you. Our next public comment is from Sabrina Fry. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm just gonna um, kind of go over just some health issues. Um, I'm Sabrina Fry, I'm the health assistant at M McCaffrey Middle School uh, for about 17, 18 years. First of all, I would like to uh, commend um, Ron Raymer and Tina Humnus for their hard, hard work. I see the strain on their faces trying to make all of this stuff work, but it does not work for middle school. It is designed different. We have 350 some seventh graders. We have 378 eighth graders. Um, that's a lot. And under a cohort, they cannot be mixed. And I just see them struggling to try and make this work. Um, I do keep track of the CDC um, cases in Galt. Um, we had 10 positives this weekend. We had one more death, which is our eighth death in Galt. We had three new cases on Tuesday and three more cases today. We are in an increase. We are right now at a total of 662 cases. Um, we were really doing good the first two weeks of October. It finally, since March, finally leveled off. But now for the last two, the last three weeks, it has increased every day. My question or some of my um, comments are the teams. It says under the guidelines and stuff that one class is considered a cohort. Middle school works in teams. So we're going to end up, um, you know, going into different um, cohorts and we're going to talk about contamination. I'd like to ask um, about the testing of staff and students. It says that staff are to be tested every two weeks. My question is what if, if a staff does not have any symptoms and it's their turn to be tested, are they forced to be tested? That was one thing I was gonna ask. Um, another thing is, uh, Students being dropped off. What a lot of parents just drop them off down the block and then the student walks to the class. What do we do there? Um, another thing is you have a, I guess you're going to be putting online uh, parents filling out like this half sheet if they have a fever, a cough, da 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 da. Thank and you. then Your time is up. when they Okay, and then when the kids come in and stuff, we're supposed to have them have this piece of paper. Who's going to be monitoring on, online if they turned in a paper? This is not going to work. You either have to have it all across the board. Everybody has to have a piece of paper or they have to have an app on their phone so that they can show us. Thank, uh, you, because, thank you, Sabrina. Fry. Yep. We appreciate it. your time is up. Thank you so much. That was good. That was good timing. I was done. <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina. Have Thank you, Sabrina. Thank Our you. next comment is from Amy Mangeli. I uh, thumbs up if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Amy Mangeli, and I teach fourth grade at Valley Oaks. I felt compelled to speak tonight as we consider when the best time is to transition back to face-to-face -to -face learning. 
At the last board meeting, I brought up the idea of waiting until after the first of the year to transition back to face-to-face -face learning. I mentioned that waiting until after the holidays seemed like the smartest time for implementation. It was later discussed by a board member that there are holidays every month. So we really could always be waiting until after the holidays. Since all of this began in March, we have had many holidays. We've had Easter, Mother's Day, Cinco de Mayo, Memorial Day, Father's Day, 4th of July, Labor Day, just to name a few. Up to this point, each family has had to decide if and how to celebrate these holidays. Fortunately, up to this point, weather allowed, um, weather allowed all of these holidays to be, po to be po potentially celebrated outside for a little extra added safety. Even so, we watch numbers of COVID cases increase for the two weeks after many of these holidays because people chose to gather unsafely. As a school community, we weren't affected by how many people chose to gather because we were doing distance learning. I don't know about you, but the aforementioned holidays are not celebrated the same as Christmas at my house. First of all, Christmas is not an outdoor ho holiday for my family. Is it for yours? Secondly, in my house and many others, Christmas involves many people gathering both young and old. Many come with compromised health issues. Is the same true for yours? That being said, our anticipated return date is right before we all gather with our families. It makes absolutely no sense to bring everyone together on campus for the weeks leading up to our winter break, possibly bringing COVID to our Christmas dinner table. While myself and others may have been willing to do without many of the other holidays in the past seven months, my family will not be doing without Christmas. Will yours? I've heard a number of teachers with the same concern. Many teachers are considering quarantining the two weeks before Christmas, just so they don't unknowingly bring COVID to the dinner table. Teachers are not even thinking twice about utilizing substitute teachers for December 10th on. December 10th marks two weeks before Christmas Eve. If pay is going to be docked, the cost of knowing we are protecting our own family members from COVID exposure is priceless. So I ask, do you have enough substitute teachers for that? I'm thinking not because we haven't had enough sub substitute teachers district-wide during the month of December in the years prior to COVID. After listening to all of the discussion among the district leaders tonight, I wish I could sign up for about 20 more time slots. There are so many problems with every single topic addressed in the open forum tonight. It was truly painful to sit in silence. We are not ready. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Our next public comment is Jim Volchek. All right, hey, thank you guys. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Outstanding. First of all, I would like to thank you guys all for your time. And I, as a PE teacher, I started my stopwatch, so I will be under three minutes. But I do want to, like the best part of my day today was talking to Kawhi or communicating with her and knowing that uh, Garrett is doing well and, and her daughter has three children and it makes me feel old, but I feel good. I'm looking at John right now and I know that uh, I remember years ago, I helped him hand out flyers so he can be on part of this board. And I also teach uh, Mr. Cagle's son, Carson, who is awesome. So I'm very proud to be part of this district. And you know, I'm gonna take it a little bit different direction besides the health and safety, which I think is just getting hammered. I hope, hopefully you guys are listening. I feel like, I feel like everyone's kind of said what I wanted to, but just, I did want to say that my daughter is playing uh, soccer in Illinois and she's on a soccer scholarship and they test her twice a week for COVID, everyone on campus. And they've been able to identify and stop the outbreaks. I have friends that go to University of Reno. I have another friend at Arizona. And they're, they're like college universities that have managed to stay on campus, in-person learning, and gone through it. But I would like to say as much time and as much science and as much expertise as they've used, they are sending all the kids home at Thanksgiving and saying, you know what? Take the finals online and don't come back till after New Year's. We have a lot of people that travel. So I guess my whole thing is, I really don't understand the rush to go back 
like in a three week window before Christmas when we've been doing this since March. It makes no sense to me. I don't understand the logic. Uh, st statistically speaking with all the travel going on, COVID, it will be brought back to our campuses. So I don't understand the rush other than the end of the trimester. So why can't we just wait till after New Year's? I'm not opposed to going back to work. I just don't wanna do it unintelligently. So I would prefer, I, I think what you're hearing everyone say is, can we just wait till after New Year's because everyone's gonna like hang out with their families, extended vacations. I mean, I hear plenty of people in golf saying, we're, we're doing parties. Uh, we're, I'm playing tackle football. I'm, we, we're spending the holidays with, with extended family. We're traveling out of town. So why can't we just wait till all the traveling is done and then let's just all get to work after New Year's. And you know what? There sounds like there's so many unanswered questions and we're all working right now. To, so to try to figure out how to do it while everyone's working, it seems I just don't understand the logic. So why can't we just use the two weeks? I mean, not to mention all the people that are gonna take leave of absences and you're gonna to have to fill those positions too. So I just don't understand why we can't wait till after New Year's or like try to, you know what I mean? Like, let's go back to work after New Year's, but let's, let's have a plan. And right now there's, I mean, as you've been hearing from everyone else, there's just so many unanswered questions. I don't understand the logic. So I appreciate your time and, and thank you and have a good night. Thank you very much, Jim. Our next public comment is from Michelle Perez. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Michelle. Thank you. Good evening. I appreciate you taking the time to hear what I have to say. My name is Michelle Perez. This is my seventh year teaching science to seventh graders at McCaffrey Middle School. I feel very grateful to work where I do because of the people the students, families, and coworkers that I get to work with every day. The reason I feel compelled to address the board is because of these concerning times we find ourselves in. I understand the desire and need to get students back into the classroom. I have a 10th grader who is also doing distance learning, and I would love for him to go back to in-person school so he can socialize with friends, be face-to-face -face with teachers, and just have his normal life back. But this is not the right time. It's not safe. At the time that I'm writing this letter, 42 states have seen an upsurge of COVID-19 cases. Returning to school at this time creates a host of other problems. One, it disrupts students' learning continuity because it disrupts their schedules. Students will be switching from distance learning where they see their teachers, all of their teachers every day, including office hours, to a schedule where they see their teachers two days a week with no office hours. Students will be expected to work on their own three days a week. Parents will be shouldering more of the educational responsibilities than they are now. Two, most students will experience a schedule change due to um, the fact that seventh grade has only two math teachers at this moment. Uh, electives that have seventh and eighth grade combo classes will need to be changed. And teachers that teach multiple subjects and grades um, present the problem. Three, families get together during Thanksgiving break, possibly with people that we haven't been around on a regular basis. This will increase the possibility of exposure to COVID-19. Four, our data shows that in past years, McCaffrey experiences a high rate of independent study requests and absences between Thanksgiving and winter break. If students are able to access classes via Zoom, they will be less likely to be absent. Five, the schedules that have been proposed at the middle school level leave many holes. When is sanitation supposed to take place? Students move from one class to another with five minute passing periods. There is no time to sanitize work surfaces and classrooms between classes. We are not going to be able to keep them as safe as they are now. 30 seconds remaining. Six, teachers, administrators, and yard duties are already responsible for supervising our young people to be decent civil human beings and keep them safe. Now we're being asked to supervise them to keep their masks on, maintain appropriate social distancing, and make sure their social and emotional needs are being met. This is in addition to teaching the curriculum in a completely new way. Students will still be on Chromebooks. We will, know, we will not be doing labs in science, um, and they will not be able to work in groups or, or in partners in any class. This is not NGSS. 
Students are not going back to the school that they experienced in the past. They will not be allowed to hang out with other students in the quad or eat lunch with friends. They will be required to keep their masks on the entire time and be socially distanced. Thank you for your comment. Your time. All right, thank, thank you for your time. Thank you, Michelle. Our next public comment is from Emily Lewis. Hi. Hi, Emily. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Wow, um, this is tough. Um, I don't necessarily want to have my kids return to school, but I also don't, don't necessarily want to continue distance learning. What I do want, as some of you know, because you've received my emails, is that I want the opportunity to make an informed decision about what is best for my family. I realize it doesn't look the same for other families and there's not a one size fit all um, option. There will probably, this will probably come across as abrasive, but I need direct answers to direct questions, not the non-answers that skirt the original question and in turn cause more questions. I would have assumed being the plan to return to school is in just a couple short weeks away, that they would, there would already be a plan in place with the details available. My kids need their teachers. In fact, I've loved them all. I also appreciate the gravity of this situation, but I am responsible for advocating for my children for their education, for their whole health, which includes their physical, mental, emotional, and social health. What will back to school look like? Less instruction, no recess, no lunch, no socializing with friends. And I don't really understand either that if they're socially distanced in a classroom, why are they required to wear a mask the whole time, especially the younger kids? My second grader won't wear one, I've tried. And then what is gonna be the protocol when someone has symptoms of a virus? Shut down until the results of a COVID test can be obtained? That seems absolutely ludicrous, especially given the fact that we are headed into flu season and it's a virus that's not going to go away. It's not gonna be eradicated overnight. Um, and then I was looking over the FAQ sheet that was emailed out and I'd like to know what exactly is meant by the number two testing for staff and students. I can tell you right now that you would absolutely not have my consent to stick a swab up my child's nose and it doesn't even fall under emergency care because that is non-emergent. If my child is needing testing, it would happen with our own family physician. And then how do you plan to enforce number seven, the identification and contact tracing? Wouldn't HIPAA laws protect an individual from having to disclose their personal health records? I mean, I do believe it was a couple years ago that they stopped sending out the lice notifications because they said something about it violating HIPAA or something of the, of the sort. Um, and I've said it before and I'll reiterate, I don't think it's fair to have, to, to have us fill out a survey and asking us to make a choice without all the relevant information. The, in, the, the inability to be transparent does not inspire confidence in our district that you are doing what is best for the children. I think that you're doing what you think is best for you and your numbers, but I really don't, I don't feel like that it's working out the way it should. We just need to have the details. We need transparency and we need to be able to make our own choices regardless if it's the same as the next person or not. Thank you for your consideration. And um, hopefully this night doesn't end up being too much longer for the rest of us. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Our next public comment is from Megan Haas. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Dear board members and district cabinet, my name is Megan Haas and I am a teacher at McCaffrey Middle School. I am writing this letter to address my concerns with the Galt Joint Union Elementary School District's plan to reopen schools. There is nothing I want more as a teacher than to see my students in person and interact with them as I would normally without a pandemic. Unfortunately, we are in just that, a pandemic. I am confused of the district's demand to open the schools before we go into the holiday season, when in a normal year, students are absent more. Also, the holidays bring multi-generational families together indoors without masks. What is your plan for keeping students and staff safe when, not if, COVID is brought back to our schools after these holiday get-togethers? This leads me to my next question. At the middle school level, how will you quarantine a sick student and all the students and staff members that come in contact with this student? 
The schedules that have been released to teachers involve students changing classes anywhere from three to five times a day. PE and elective classes have students from every team and both grades. To effectively quarantine, you are looking at possibly six teachers and two grade levels and six different teams that would need to be in quarantine at McCaffrey. Dr. Shower, according to your email, sent on October 23rd, the district is following guidelines from the CDPH. In the document that you linked, the guidelines say one class is considered a cohort with half of the students present at a time. It further states stable groups should stay together during the day. Per your email, stable groups are defined as fixed membership that stays together for all courses and activities. Two, the two schedules provided by the district have middle school students changing classes mixing cohorts throughout the day. I am infuriated at the lack of transparency the district has shown to the staff and parents in regards to the schedules for students returning. In your email on October 23rd, you state, we know that there are many students who are having trouble without in-person instruction and support services at school. The two schedules provided to teachers will give my students less time to interact and ask questions of me. They currently see me on Zoom for 150 minutes per week. They are then able to meet with me for small group instruction for another 120 minutes throughout the week if they have questions. The in-person schedules will allow them to interact and ask questions for 40 minutes twice a week from each teacher. The rest of the time students are not in school, they will have independent assignments to work on and they will not have access to teachers to ask questions until they attend their next in-person class. How do these models help our students who are struggling now? They will receive less time with their teachers instead of more. Thank you for allowing me to speak and I implore the board and district to reconsider opening the schools. With the in-person models being presented, I ask you who will hurt the most? Students. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Our next public comment is from Erica Duanis. Hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Good evening, board members and district cabinet. My name is Erica Duenas, and I'm a fourth year math teacher at McCaffrey Middle School. I'm here to address the concerns that I have in regards to the district's drive into reopening our schools. Please reconsider the current plan to return. As of now, the current guidelines are not catered to the middle school level, but there needs to be specific detailed cleaning protocols in place. Re reopening schools without the appropriate precautions is putting our students and staff's health, safety, and well being at risk. At this point, we haven't received clear information or training regarding the cleaning agents we will use to clean and disinfect classes. Teachers need to be provided with appropriate training and PPE to protect themselves and the students. According to the CDC, in order to clean and disinfect correctly, it is recommended to wash surfaces with a general household cleaner to remove germs, rinse with water, and follow up with an EPA registered disinfectant to kill germs. Disinfection requires the cleaning product to remain on the surface for a certain period of time, approximately three to five minutes. With only a five minute passing period, we will have to cut class early as there's not enough time to allow for the proper cleaning and disinfecting of classrooms and allow adequate time for the chemical fumes to aerate. In addition, the HVAC system in the classrooms needs to be modified to provide 100% outside air in order for the inside air to not be circulated. Simply opening windows and doors won't circulate outside air in, leaving classrooms to share the same air and not properly ventilate the cleaning chemicals that are going to be used to clean and disinfect. Under the proposed schedules, our students will spend less time interacting directly with their teachers and more time completing work independently. Right now, I'm able to interact and connect with all 130 of my students for 30 minutes daily, a total of 150 minutes of live instruction a week, and in addition, be available to them during their asynchronous time from 1.15 to 3 o'clock. With the proposed schedules, I will only be seeing the students in person twice a week, 80 minutes total of live instruction time, and have no time to provide additional face-to-face -face interaction as it is reserved for planning their asynchronous work and for meetings. I've always felt that math was best learned when working with paper and pencil, and with transitioning to in-person, work will still have to be assigned and completed online as paper and pencil cannot be used in person without letting the paper sit for 72 hours before I can review and provide adequate feedback. These past 10 weeks, I've been able to build connections with my students and restarting with a cohort and possibly rescheduling will only bring us back to day one of school instead of progressing into the second trimester as we are supposed to. 
Cohorting is a commonly used strategy in many elementary schools in which students have the same teacher and classmates during the entire day. But this is not the case for middle school. With about 800 students at McCaffrey, even with 50% of the population being on campus at one time, they will be rotating to multiple classrooms at different times of the day. Other surrounding districts are not reopening their classrooms at the middle and high school levels until January. I urge you to follow their considerations of the health and safety for their students, their families, and their staff. Thank you for your time for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you, Erica. Our next public comment is from Tracy Leveroni. Good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address the board, uh, Dr. Shower, the superintendent, and cabinet members this evening. My name is Tracy Leveroni, and I'm proud to be an eighth grade math teacher at McCaffrey Middle School. Uh, as a true extrovert, I live for the day when I'll be back in the classroom with my students and getting to enjoy their wonderful personalities. And my comments and questions this evening are about the risk of COVID in the Galt community. Uh, the state has classified a county as widespread risk if there are seven more, seven or more case, more than seven cases per day per 100,000 of population. In the past week, October 21st through the 27th, Galt had 18 cases of COVID uh, with a population of 27,538, which is the 2020 population of Galt. At that rate, that's 65 cases per 100,000 of population. If you break that down to the daily, that's 9.3 cases, which is far above the seven case uh, threshold. Sorry, I'm shaking. Um, I ask you, what number of cases per day do you feel should be the threshold for the community? Galt is a small community and very unlikely to swing Sacramento County from red to purple, but it, nonetheless, it's still not safe. Uh, two communities that have gone back to school that were mentioned before are Rockland. Rockland has a, a COVID case of 0.5% in that population. Another community I heard mentioned as going back to school is River Delta. I live in Rio Vista and in Rio Vista, we're at about 0.5% of the population has had COVID, okay? In Galt, it's 2.6. <laughs> I don't know the reason, but I just know it's very much more risk in Galt. And I think that needs to be taken into account for the students the families of the students who are going to be exposed to them and the staff. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Tracy. Our next public comment is from Nicole Williamson. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to probably sound like a broken record here just because I wrote this before this meeting started, but I'm going to go for it. I want to start by saying that at the beginning of distance learning, myself and both my children, one transitional kinder and the other second grader, were struggling and frustrated most days. But with a little time and attention to setting good routines, we have actually thrived at distance learning. I have watched my four-year-old learn how to actually read in the past few weeks. <clears throat> my second grader is actually excelling. She's doing so well in math, language arts, and in reading. Both of my kids' teachers are successfully teaching reading groups, but if you guys put the alphabet, that will definitely be a hot mess. I understand that my two kids are not alone in the district and that the distance learning is not 100% working for everybody. But what I do know is that all children, who sorry, thrive from consistency. <clears throat> I just wanna read that again. Children thrive from consistency. I personally feel that going back to school 17, 17 days after Halloween, one week before Thanksgiving break and five weeks before Christmas break is not the right decision. Without COVID worries, it's still cold and flu season. So many people have different standpoints on COVID as it is, with some following rules and others not. How is there not gonna be an outbreak of some kind? <clears throat> with that, what's the actual plan for an outbreak? Contact tracing, quarantining, rapid testing? I am not okay with the testing of my four and seven-year-olds twice a week. That doesn't even make sense since Kaiser said rapid, rapid testing is very limited and normal testing can take 14 days for results. I know everyone has a different standpoint on this, but for me, I am more afraid of my children going back and forth 
with their education and being used as guinea pigs just to see how it all might work out. I am more afraid <clears throat> of my children having a, a chaotic day instead of learning from the comfort of their own home. I am more afraid of their teachers not being able to have their own discretion over their own class than I am of this virus. An Elk Grove teacher wrote on, an, on a forum close earlier today that her class will be coming to school, zooming from their desks so that the kids who stayed on distance learning could still join. Is this the plan for our kids? If so, what is the actual point? I just learned that as, as of now, the teachers can't even touch the kids at all, comfort them or anything. Have you ever been in a kinder class? Do you know how much comforting is needed? Only one teacher supposedly is allowed in the class. Not even the IAs are supposed to be allowed in there. The principal, can, the principal can't even come into the class. That would be going outside of her cohort. None of this makes any real sense. An idea I have thought about today is that I understand that one size doesn't fit for everybody. So if the teachers are going to have to figure everything out on their own, it should be left up to their discretion to talk to their students and the parents and come up with a plan that works best for the needs of their class, especially once when it comes to distance learning versus in-person learning. Because for some teachers, it is, is working and for some it's just not. <laughs> my standpoint on this is that my family is all for going back to school on campus and learning. But why can't we just not wait until the circumstances are improving and the kids can go back with the school day looking more like the one that they left behind in March? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Nicole. Our next public comment is from Kathy Loesch. Okay, good evening. My name is Kathy Loesch and I teach sixth grade at Valley Oaks. I'm speaking once again to urge that the board postpone the return to in-person instruction. On July 13th, when the district was discussing whether to reopen in August, the number of reported COVID cases in Galt was 220. Since then, the number of cases has tripled to 662, with a 5% increase just since October 16th. Scientists and physicians predict that the numbers will continue to climb as we move into cooler weather and people spend more time indoors. I've said this before, but it bears repeating. There are families in our town who continue not to accept the seriousness of COVID. They socialize with others, host and attend parties, travel out of town and grumble at wearing a mask when interacting with those outside their immediate bubble. With up to 16 persons in a classroom for two and a half hours at a time, the risk to all involved increases exponentially. The most recent survey sent to parents was extremely misleading. It did not describe the two in-person scenarios under consideration, but rather asked parents if their child would return for on-campus learning. Parents and students have been shocked to find out what returning to school will actually look like. These are just a few of the activities that will not be occurring. Gathering on the playground before school, working with a partner or small group in class, browsing for books in the classroom library, passing out and collecting papers, sharing classroom supplies, hanging out with friends at recess, walking around the classroom for a stretch break, eating lunch in the cafeteria and receiving after school homework help. Yes, students will be able to see half of their classmates, but they will not be able to interact with one another or socialize as they anticipate being able to do. Teaching and learning will be impacted if the AM PM on campus scenario is enacted. My students currently have at least 15 hours per week with me face-to-face -face via Zoom with unlimited additional access via Google message, text, and phone throughout the day. If we move into the AM PM proposal, students would be in person with me for 10 hours per week with limited additional access as I would be teaching the other group at the opposite time. My students currently have five to eight hours of asynchronous work per week. Under the proposed scenario, their independent workload would increase dramatically. If I am absent right now, one of my colleagues can cover my students' synchronous lessons by absorbing them into the colleague's Zoom session. If I am absent when teaching on campus, a substitute would be needed to cover the in-class portion of the day. With the substitute challenges we encounter every year during normal times, I can't even imagine having the capacity to cover multiple classrooms under these conditions. I remain uncertain that all students, families, and employees will diligently monitor their health for possible symptoms. I remain uncertain that our classrooms will be adequately sanitized between groups of students. I remain uncertain that the school campus will be a safe environment for anyone. The health and safety of everyone must be paramount, and there must be an extremely high level of trust that everyone involved is following all necessary precautions. I do not currently possess that high level of trust. Thank you for your consideration. 
Thank you, Kathy. Our next public comment is from Kim Lazama. Hi, I'm Kim Lazama, Valley Oaks School, fourth grade. Um, my question is, what is the benefit of going back like this? You need to be sure that you have very concrete reasons based on facts if you are willing to go against what almost 80% of your teachers feel is safe. Although no one thinks that distance learning is better than our regular full day school schedule, it is definitely better than anything that is being proposed right now. Through distance learning, I can work with small groups. In person, that won't be possible. A small group of just three students would stretch out 12 feet. Where is that going to happen? Through distance learning, I can speak privately with a student in a breakout room during office hours or through the chat feature. In person, that will have to take place in front of everyone or loudly enough to be heard from six feet away. Through distance learning, my schedule allows time for office hours where I can help kids on their independent work or just talk to them. There is no opportunity during any of your proposals for anyone in any one-on-one -on -one teacher student interaction. We won't be able to see a student's math page, worksheet, or the word they need help with from six feet away any better than we can when held up to the screen in Zoom. It doesn't get us back to being able to use some of our best teaching strategies, small groups, pair share, proximity, one-on-one -on -one assistance. None of that is possible under the pandemic safety protocols. This plan doesn't address the childcare issues of our families. Is it going to help anyone to have to arrange to get their child to and from school in the middle of the day and to find childcare for the days and hours they aren't in school? Is it going to help, help for them to be the sole assistance on all of the hours of independent work per week? One of the main concerns everyone has is the social interaction that kids are missing. This plan does not and cannot address that at all. There will be no recess or lunch for kids to play. We won't even be able to put them in social groups in class because of the safe distance requirements, which I am able to do now in breakout rooms during distance learning. We already cut our instructional day hours when we transitioned to distance learning. Now we're going to have to cut them even more to be in person under these conditions. Our students will get less instruction than they are getting during distance learning. In addition, we are going to require hours more independent work with no assistance, which is the hardest part of distance learning for students to do. Although distance learning is very hard on all of us and certainly not better than full day instruction pre or post pandemic, many of us have still had some success with it. Surprisingly, one of the biggest successes I've had is the social interaction. There are lots of ways that I found to let kids hang out, interact, play, and have fun with each other and with me through distance learning. I love the ability for some of my quieter, shy students to be able to actively participate through the chat during class, something that's not available in the regular classroom environment. The reasoning for going back right now does not appear sound or to be based on facts. It will solve none of the problems you're trying to solve. It will just create new problems. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Our next public comment is from Maria Burnell. <clears throat> yeah, just a minute. Okay, we're working to get her on here. Good evening. Hello, Maria. Good evening. Hi, I'm mother of three, a first grader, a second gr uh, grader, and a third grader at River Oaks. Um, and I just want to know, or I, I wanted to let, let you guys know that we were all misinformed in the survey, uh, like everybody else said. Um, I don't think that we knew what we were getting ourselves into um, with not knowing all the facts that we heard today. I could probably bet 99.9% of the people are gonna pull their kids because I will be the first one to pull my kids if we are going back right away. Um, it seems like. Maria, we cannot hear you. I'm not sure if it's your device or if it's on our side. Where we're supposed to be at. And I appreciate that, but please, I beg you guys to make the best decision for the whole community. I have spoken to five or six different Hispanic communities and they all say the same thing that they will not be sending their kids. Um, the scores are definitely gonna drop as well um, because it was so hard for us to do Zoom and to learn the SIPS program. And if we go back, the SIPS program will not be available. Um, because we were misinformed, I ask that you please table this 
I don't think it's going to happen until January. I definitely believe that we do need another school year. So if you guys can please make the best decisions. Flexibility was a word that you guys said to use for us. I ask you to be flexible and to please listen. And to my total, it was 26 that are not okay with us going back and one person that says yes. So if I know math correctly, majority rules and please make the best decision for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Our next public comment is from Sarah Murray. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, Sarah Murray here, fifth grade teacher Valley Oaks, thank you. Um, I just wanted, um, it's interesting listening to everybody and I'm trying to understand their point of view and they have some really good points. Um, <clears throat> it's also been stated by a few people that their students are thriving during distance learning. Um, I have to disagree with this. This is not an educational model of thriving. It is simply a surviving situation, not thriving. Uh, please note, those are two very different things. Surviving means you're a lot, you're trying to stay alive and stay above water. Thriving means you're, proper, you're prospering, you're flourishing in your element. Um, these kids are not thriving by any means. I'm not saying that means let's rush them back to school. I'm just saying they're not thriving. They're not getting a proper education. Um, let's see, we, I don't know when we're going to go back, but when we do go back, I do agree with some of the parents that are saying, you know, this is a weird schedule. This is not really making sense. What are we going to do? That, that would be frustrating as a parent. I can see that. Um, I am concerned with the people suggesting and wanting January as a better start date. I can see their reasons why. Um, however, I'm concerned. Um, I don't know if they think COVID's going to disappear. I don't know if they think COVID will be less of an issue in January. Um, my biggest fear is that this is going to happen at every month's board meeting and that every month it'll be pushed and pushed and pushed until the school year has come to an end once again. Um, and if we're distance learning all school year, oof, that is not gonna be good news. Um, and as far as the a PM schedule, I just, I'm unsure why we are returning or have to return to a hybrid model. Um, many school districts have not returned in that fashion. They've returned fully or um, whatnot with PPE in place, of course. Um, so I was just, yeah, a, a lot of parents come to me with that too. So I'm um, curious about that. 30 seconds remaining. Okay. Um, the last thing I wanna state is that I was told by many that teachers are not essential workers. Um, we are essential workers. And um, it was actually deemed so nationally on August 21st this year. So um, I appreciate you listening to me. Um, I hope you guys have some more coffee and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Sarah. Our next public comment is from Martha Velma. Oh Lord. Velma. Yes, hello. Yes, hi, Martha. And good evening. Um, I did want to just, um, a lot that I was going to say was said already. Um, I want to second what Ms. Corona said so um, eloquently. Everything that she stated is just so spot on. Mm -hmm. um, we, as parents and even as staff, um, were not informed of all of this information that I'm just hearing tonight. I did not know how it would look when I answered the survey as an employee and as a parent. Um, our numbers are up here. They are going up all over the nation. I don't see this as a safe time to return as has been stated over and over again. 
Most schools and colleges that have reopened have had to reclose at some time, whether it be temporarily or completely closing down because they have had outbreaks. Um, when the kids go back, they're not going back to normal schedule. I, they look, they sound like they're going to be herded in one way direction through the hallways, especially at the middle school level. They're not going to get the extra help like the one that I provide to kids, especially those in upper grades after hours, after their regular Zoom hours, they join me for extra help as an instructional assistant. They won't be getting that, not only from their teachers, but from me. And just all in all, it sounds like nothing's really worked out. Um, I don't know how parents are going to get their kids to and from school if they're already at work like me. I don't know how I would be able to take and pick my child up from school, which is going to be across town from my site. And um, we don't know yet what's going to happen with the high schoolers. Sounds like they're going to have different schedules, different days and times that they'll be attending at the middle school and at the elementary level, making it difficult for those of us that have kids at the both schools or work at the various ones. Um, all in all, um, the whole working with face shields and masks, as has been brought up, is not going to work for those of us trying to teach kids phonics and reading. It's not going to be feasible to do that. So they will not be receiving proper um, instruction on that. That cannot be done at a distance and it can't be done safely at a close proximity. So I urge you to postpone this because starting in January, as everybody has stated, is not because COVID is going to disappear, but it's because people would have gotten all of their traveling out of the way and we'll be starting with a new trimester versus disrupting everything temporarily only to reclose again. And it'll give the teachers and staff more time to prepare for this. So as a, as a staff member and as a parent, I urge you to postpone this until at least January and make things more transparent to staff and parents when putting surveys or information out there. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Our next public comment is from Allison Willie. Hello, thank you um, for allowing me to speak tonight. I'm a fifth grade teacher at River Oaks Elementary School. I wanna say that distance learning is challenging for all. I understand that as a teacher and I'm lucky to have so many wonderful parents and students that are dedicated to their work. I wanna make sure that we know that 77% of teachers would prefer to wait until January for the safety of themselves and their students. The current time that I work with students right now is four hours live and one and a half hours in small groups, which translates to 20 hours a week and four and a half hours of small groups. This would be reduced to 10 hours in person with a new plan, which I think is unacceptable to the students. Currently, I have nearly 100% attendance for my students, and I fear that with re the reduced time and with the difficult schedule, that 100% will decrease. Um, the idea is to benefit children, but I'm worried that less time with the teacher will not be beneficial to them. Teachers are afraid to return to school for their own safety. While I understand that children are not as susceptible to COVID, I feel that teachers and their families are, and that needs to be um, realized. Kids in my class on Zoom talk about wanting to return to school every single day. I know that they miss recess, they miss their friends, and they also miss being together. But I feel that hybrid learning will not allow that to happen. 
many of the safety regulations are very vague. And from what I've seen at the school, there's been very few changes on campus that I am um, have seen in person. I want to return, I want to give hugs, I want to be with my students, but I want to do it when it's safe and when it's going to be beneficial to the students. Lastly, I'm very concerned that many of the classes will be disbanded and students will lose their teachers that they've made connections with for the past um, three months. And I do not think that that's gonna be beneficial to these students who are going through such a traumatizing time. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and I hope you'll make the right decision tonight. Thank you, Allison. Our next public speaker is Tracy Watt. Good evening, everyone. As a second grade teacher in the district, I can't wait to return to on-campus learning. Distance learning is hard. I work harder in distance learning than I've ever worked in my whole career. Um, I'm tired. Um, on-campus learning is way easier than distance learning. But what does on-campus look like, on-campus learning look like with all the required safety protocols in place? Let's be clear, it will not look the same at each school or at each grade level. The school day will not look anything like it did before the pandemic. Currently on the distance learning model, I provide 130 minutes of live instruction for my students a day, seven day, uh, five days a week. During that 130 minutes, I provide each child with a small group reading lesson, a math lesson, and 30 minutes of language arts instruction. Also, because of Zoom, there are five students that can mainstream into my classroom for 45 minutes a day. This is how returning to on campus will look like for my second graders. Students will come to class for 150 minutes a day, four days a week. Before entering my classroom, they will first have to come through the school gate with a slip of paper that verifies that they are not showing symptoms of COVID-19. It will probably take the health clerk five to 10 minutes to get everybody through the gates and seated in their classrooms. We will also have a going home process that will probably take five to 10 minutes as well. So now we're down to about 130 minutes of learning. I'm assuming we'll be allowed to take a 10 minute break sometime during that time frame. Now we have about 120 minutes of instruction, which is less than what they are getting now. During that time, I will provide each student a small group reading lesson, a math lesson, and about 30 minutes of language arts. The only difference between distance learning and on-campus learning will be which screen my students are looking at. The computer screen while in the safety and comfort of their own home or the big screen behind me on the whiteboard. The content will be exactly the same. Fortunately, the five students that are now mainstreaming into my class will no longer be able to join us. Safety protocols require that everyone wear a mask. And while I am so relieved about this, I'm also very sad because I won't be able to see my students' cute little smiles. And I love their smiles. And they won't be able to see mine. And I think that's really sad. Due to the safety protocols, I also won't be able to sit next to a child to help them. They will be isolated in their six square feet of space. There will not be any roaming about the classroom, working with a partner, sitting on the carpet for story time or sharing supplies. There will not be any hugs or even high fives. I totally understand why these safety protocols are necessary, but they change what we imagine a school day to look like. Yes, I want to return to on-campus learning, but not like this. I want it to be like it was before COVID-19, and I'm pretty sure that's what we all want. Since it won't be the same, will parents find value in it still? Who knows? Without all the details, how is a parent supposed to make the right decision? Please figure this out quickly. Please give our families all the information so that they can make the right choices. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Our next public comment is from Elaine Truel. Hi, good evening. I am Elaine Troll, teacher at Valley Oaks School. I teach fifth grade and I am here with a growth mindset and the power of yet something I teach my students every day. I've spoken at many board meetings and my feelings have not changed. I still will do whatever it takes to bring my students back into the classroom safely whenever that may be. Why? Tonight's live stream is a perfect example. 
the constant technology technology issues with the sound is just a small issue that happens daily on my Zooms. The small images shared on a share screen are hard to read. Imagine if you were kicked out several times because your Wi-Fi was not strong enough. Being in school will take these issues away. My two hours on Zoom are not truly two full hours of instruction. It is me saying, please mute, turn on your video. Can you find the link? That's not where you're supposed to be. Can you join us? Are you there? That's not effective teaching. It is survival mode. Students are trying to learn through several interruptions at home, distractions, language barriers, technology issues, and so much more that will go away with being face-to-face. -face. Attendance is also an issue. Attendance is horrible. Right now, a student is marked present when they show up for attendance. If they leave five minutes after I've taken attendance, they are still considered present. That's not 100%. If I took attendance after every brain break that we take, music class, PE, many of my students would be considered absent. I am averaging 18 students on Zoom, 15 are missing. How is that okay? How is that effective? Also, just because a student is on Zoom, their video is off, they are muted, muted, but there's no guarantee that they are physically there in front of their computer. When I look on light speed, I can see that they are not actively engaged and not working with me. Therefore, I can assume they are not there. I have students leave Zoom and not come back. That's not learning. Many have concerns about students sitting for two and a half hours in my classroom. Guess what? They're sitting anyways in front of their screen all day long. I am sitting in front of a computer for most of the day. My students ask about coming back to school daily, not because they want recess, but because they want less time doing their math on the computer. They want more time reading real books. They want less time reading online. I can go on. It is not about being together or touching each other or hugs. It's about learning and with me being there. My eighth grader daughter, my eighth grade daughter has great grades. She has A's in fact, and to her teacher, she is probably doing fantastic. But what they don't see is that she stays on the computer till 10 p.m. because she's a perfectionist. I have to force her to turn off her computer. She has more anxiety this year and she's not eating due to the stress. And she asks me daily when she can go back to school. My second grader is drowning in asynchronous work and I can't help her when I'm teaching. Also distance learning is not successful with any of my students who have learning disabilities with IEPs. They are not successful. Being face-to-face -face is possible. We need to be proactive and get ready for it now. Let's get started. I saw it happen today successfully with a small cohort. Students were excited, engaged, and they did, and they did not, it did not take all day for safety routines. They learned, they came home, sat down at their desk. They knew that they had to be safe in order to stay at school and they were determined to do so. They learned without getting kicked out of class. They didn't miss any instruction and they were successful today. I do have concerns with the AMPM model for those teachers who do have children. I don't know where my child will go when I still have to stay at school but I have a growth mindset that we will figure it out. Thank you for all of your time and efforts and listening to our questions, concerns, and striving to do what's best for our students. Thank you, Elaine. Our next public comment is from Olivia Rhodes. Olivia, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, you can start now. Okay. Hi, my name is Olivia Rhodes and I'm a fourth grade student at Valley Oaks. Distance learning has affected me by my sadness. I'm sad because I miss school. I miss seeing my friends. I miss my teacher and I miss seeing my teacher. And I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated because some of my Zoom calls crash and People get dropped out of my Zoom meetings and my, some of my people in my class um, talk, talk over my teacher while she's trying to teach us a lesson and I can't understand her. And I really, really miss my friends and I really, really miss my teachers and I wish I could see all of them. And I just wish that my teachers would do this for my students and me and I just want some normalcy. 
I also understand that things will not look normal for me, but I am willing to do whatever it takes to get to the end of the tunnel and back to the five days a week. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Olivia. Our next public comment is from Heather Wetzel. Good evening, my name is Heather Wetzel and I'm a fifth grade teacher at Marengo Ranch, a parent of an eighth grader at McCaffrey and a ninth grader at Gold High. I am also the current GEFA president. Tonight I'm speaking on behalf of many of our certificated staff members. Many of them have already covered things that I will talk about and so many more of them have brought up issues I wasn't going to cover. <sighs> I came tonight with a heavy heart only made heavier by listening to everyone and the worry and the concern from not only staff, but also parents and community members. Almost every one of my daughter's former McCaffrey teachers spoke tonight. Almost all of Wyatt's teachers have spoken also. As a parent that hits very hard to know how worried they are and that my child might be part of that worry. Since March, all of our staff members have had to learn a new way of doing business. For teachers, that meant figuring out a way to teach our children in a digital only format. None of us were taught how to do this. We adapted and have excelled by speaking, spending countless days and nights watching videos, calling each other, taking webinars, buying units online, and basically recreating a wheel that didn't exist except at a collegiate level. We didn't wait for the district to figure all of this out for us. We jumped in and got down to business because our students matter and they needed us. We also needed to be safe and make it possible to protect our students' health too. State and county guidelines have been changing on a daily basis. Just as soon as numbers start to decrease, they shoot right back up again. Sacramento is still in the red tier with numbers increasing. The same health and safety concerns that existed in March are still in play today. We all want to be back with our students and teaching them in the way that we know works best. But at this time, the science cannot be ignored. The bargaining team has been meeting with the district almost weekly to come up with a tentative agreement. We just aren't there yet. And we have been working together. We work very well together. There are so many pieces to this puzzle that it can't be rushed. What will leave of absences mean? How will we get subs to cover us when we're ill? What happens when a student or staff member gets ill and half the class has to quarantine? Do I still teach the other class? What if I'm the sick person? How do I explain AB or AMPM models to a sub? What happens if parents lie on the screeners and they send their child to sick? child to school sick anyway? Will transportation be provided? Will we be tested for COVID? When? Where? What if a janitor calls in sick and he doesn't have coverage? We all understand the need for students to be back in the classroom, but really be back like normal. I see Facebook posts daily about us returning to school and I see how confused parents are. Many are under the impression that it'll be a normal school year, but that isn't the case. The blended model will be AM PM model, which means I'll have a group in the morning at about 1030 and another group in the afternoon that starts around 12. Mondays will be independent learning days, which means kids will actually have more time. They're expected to complete work or practice skills without my guidance. Most teachers are not having much success with getting kids to complete any work outside of the Zoom sessions. Each day I end up with more questions and solutions for our current situation. I implore you to please consider the pushback date of December 1st, if not January, like many of the surrounding districts, so that we can continue to be thorough and strategic in coming up with a safe plan for all stakeholders. We know the plan won't be perfect, but we owe it to all stakeholders to try our very best. This cannot be a situation of ready or not, here we come. Thank you for your time and your continued support.
Thank you, Heather. Our next public comment is from Chelsea Haight or Haight. We're working on it. There we go. Um, yeah, I have two special needs children and the idea of them losing their mainstream resources would devastate them. Mine have excelled extremely and we've seen so much progress this year with the online education to lose that instead of waiting till January when we have higher potential of being able to keep our mainstream classes and all of our other resources, let's just wait. Um, and as for that, what about the IEPs that we've already agreed to and then the shortening of hours? How does that work? I, I don't even know how to, I said, yeah, I wanted my kids back on campus on the survey, but I did not know that this was what was all gonna happen. It really devastates me. And I know that my children are gonna be devastated in return as well. Thank you guys for hearing me tonight. Thank you, Chelsea. Our next public comment is from Dean Coons. Good evening, my name is Annette Kunze. I'm actually speaking, um, so it's Annette and not Dean. Thank my you. husband and I, thank you. My husband and I have had four children in the district and will have grandchildren in the district soon. But today I come as a Galt citizen, a citizen like every other that benefits from an educated populace. But education is not merely sharing information. It's a holistic experience that includes learning to line up, laughing, conflict resolution with peers, affectionate showing of praise and comfort, running on the playground. And while we recognize many are doing their very best with what they have before them, it's not the education system that we promised our children or that has made us prevail as a nation. Like anything, the further we get away, the harder it will be to find our way back and our education system will be permanently and severely degraded. We propose several recommendations. First, get back to school. Robust, normal learning, healthy full-time instruction, and not the robotic part-time models we heard discussed today. Others are doing it all over the world with success. The inescapable fact is we will likely have COVID on our planet the rest of our natural born lives. It's a simple math equation at this point. Even if there is a vaccine to come our way, it would be several years of reticence before wide acceptance. We can no longer use that as an excuse not to educate our children properly. We need to say we will push on just like we have faced every other thing that has allowed our species to endure for thousands of years. Second, I would propose a compassionate approach when returning to school. We love children because of their energy and youthful existence. Don't strip them of this by enforcing draconian rules and overly strict measures. We have done a really good job with things like the flu. Common sense has consistently prevailed. Let the children be children. They will not follow the rules perfectly and that should be okay with everybody. Along the same lines, teachers should not be unduly pressured to overlay and strict, enforce strict rules. Third, I urge you to do your own detailed research. Look at death rates, look at COVID testing and the positivity rates compared to population. Look at how many individuals are getting along just fine with an over 99% recovery rate in most ages. Many deaths are the result of preventable co comorbidities. Once you do your own research, it will ease your mind. Yes, you can take it as a call to action to live a healthy life, but recognize we will never be able to make it 100% perfect. There's a quote in the movie Shawshank Redemption. It's a movie that so many call their favorite because it speaks personally to our human existence. At one point behind thick prison walls, Andy turns to Red, played by Morgan Freeman, and says with unwavering conviction, I guess it comes down to a simple choice, really. Get busy living or get busy dying. We can all continue to imprison ourselves with fear, but please don't do that to our children or to our education system. Release the hostage and let's all get busy living. If you personally feel you are too afraid to teach our children, I propose that you don't go to Walmart, don't take an Uber, don't go to a movie, don't go to a restaurant, don't travel, don't go to sporting events or theme parks, don't go to holiday gatherings, because if you can do any of those, you can go to school and teach our children. And if you can't do it now, we're not sure what will be different in January unless you are going to let school go forever or just go back to full-time instruction, which it sounds like many teachers are in full support of. Thank you very much for your time this evening. 
Thank you, Mrs. Coons. Our next public comment is from Sunshine Yameda. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Sunshine. Thank you. So hello, my name is Sunshine Amada, and I'm a fourth grade teacher at River Oaks and a 20 year veteran. I'm concerned over the misinformation presented and the lack of answers that have been provided regarding the preparedness of reopening schools. It will take more than the three minutes to clarify what I heard presented tonight, but here we go. Bottom line, you did not get answers to your questions regarding this plan. And that's because there isn't one. Let's make it clear, it's not about the date, it is mostly about being prepared and planned out. So let's start with the FAQ. It was reported that there is, on the FAQ, there is no time scheduled to re, um, reflect and adjust and improve after each phase. So there are small cohorts happening right now, but we have no data that's shared with us to talk about how that's going. We're moving from zero to 50% capacity in a tier two, which means in my case of a class of 32, we're going from students not being exposed to being exposed to 16 family cohorts and me being exposed to 32. And I don't have a big library to put them in. I just have my classroom. And what about the families who wanna stay home? You are now shifting the stress to a new group of people and creating brand new problems with no information to give them. They're left wondering what will happen and they are worried that they will be left out. Now, as far as the schedule, there was no plan for the schedule. No information has been given to parents um, in time to let them make the arrangements that they need to make. And they talk about students will benefit but the district is making promises to parents in the community regarding something that hasn't even been created yet. And they're giving you hypothetical possibilities that just aren't true. No plan was given to you tonight about what teaching will look like at the elementary campus. And I currently teach all subject matters on a full day schedule every day. To make up for this substantial decrease in time, I'm going to have to teach far less than what I'm doing right now. And this is not personalized learning. Personalized learning is not just teaching to fewer students and we are giving them more independent work that is not personalized either. There is no plan which causes the burden of creating it or there is no plan. So this causes the, create, the burden of creating it to fall back onto teachers to make it work just to meet a deadline. And giving us prep days and making us plan it is not fair. Students will have to learn a whole new routine and set up a whole new safety procedure to come to school, such as temperature checks, a new cloth mask every day, all school materials packed, a specific route while on campus, keeping physically distanced, staying in their seats, new bathroom procedures. Kids had trouble finding their Zoom link on the first day of school. Imagine what they're going to do when they're thrown into this schedule with no preparation because at this time there is no date, there's no information that we can share with families. This is not an exciting first day of school that kids usually look forward to and setting this up too quickly only creates trauma and anxiety for students and families. And let's go to the safety guidelines. Stable groups should stay together during the day. Arrivals will be staggered if possible. My class is 16 students and that takes up 102 feet for a line. Imagine about the whole school, this is teaching time lost and parents dropping kids off. Um, close to arrival time? Do we even know what that's going to look like and if we are able to do that? Um, and families will be asked to screen students come before coming to school. How will we know that that happened? Um, students will have temperature checks and they will stay home or they should stay home um, given a list of symptoms. Well, what happens to their learning when they can't come to school because they have a symptom or they're sent home due to become a symptom? So that's even more learning loss. And this also applies to teachers. So what happens when I have a runny nose in the middle of class? The amount of learning loss and the anxiety that this creates happens because there is no clear plan. So I please keep asking questions, but demand they be answered. Thank you. Thank you, Sunshine. Our next public comment is from Mrs. Hoff. Mrs. Bott, could you hold just for a second, please? Sure. Thank you. Uh, board President Malkin and board members, um, we have four more speakers left, and the thought was uh, 
for help to go to finish the four speakers. And then we have just one report item that we would need to do, if that would be all right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and the other reports, we'll, we'll move those to another meeting. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Bob. And Dr. Schauer, we we actually have six people with their hands up. One we may have heard from before, um, but we do have six. It's it's I, I'm not able to tell um, who added themselves after the fact because some people dropped off and they had to re log in again. So I have a total of six left. Are we okay with that? Okay, yes, all right, we, we will take all six. Okay, thank you. Our next public comment is from Mrs. Hoff. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I have four kids in the district from high school to preschool. Um, I don't feel the district has been completely clear with information written in district ease instead of um, layman's terms. For preschool, um, from my understanding for preschool, sitting in one spot behind a plastic shield, no dancing or singing, minimal movement, walking in line six feet apart, no playground because it can't be sanitized, no ball play, no playing with friends, no sharing of any kind, no contact, with, which means no hugs or high fives from teachers or peers, and that's from three or four year olds. Uh, for elementary, wearing a mask the whole time, no sharing, no playground, no hugs or high fives from or moving about, desks isolated from others, marching in lines of six feet apart. They're not inmates, they're kids. Kids need recess. Our kids' mental health, especially our young, pre especially our young preschoolers, will be greatly impacted. Young children learn best through singing, dancing, hands-on, and interactive play with peers. Wearing a mask for long periods of time is not healthy either because of the buildup of bacteria that can also make kids sick. The guidelines from the district, the Department of Health are just that guidelines, suggestions. They're not mandates or laws. Children are not super spreaders of the new of strain of flu, which it is a SARS virus, so it is the flu virus. They are also not impacted by this virus like adults. Um, yet you're acting like they have the plague. If children were super spreaders, there would be mass outbreaks in daycares and schools across the country um, that have been open the entire time or for at least the last few months, and that just isn't so. Our children's mental and emotional health is just as important as their physical health. With these restrictions in place for children who aren't even spreaders of this virus is cruel and wrong. Schools should be open as normal, like they are during cold and flu season, for parents, children, and staff that are ready and willing to go back to normal. Any that are worried and not ready to go back should be allowed to continue distance learning. Oh, and by the way, um, uh, let's see. Seconds remaining. Yeah, by the way, um, Parents know that if your child's teacher doesn't get enough students um, signed up for their class, that they will have to rearrange the classes and they might end up with the teacher that they haven't been Zooming with for the past few months. More drastic changes on our kids. They have been through enough. It's time to get back to normal. Thank you, Mrs. Hoff. Our next public comment is from Jojo T. My mouth. We're working to get this person on. You may need to unmute yourself. Oh, you may need to unmute yourself. Jojo T, it may be your device. Okay, we're gonna bypass this person um, and go to our next public comment. You Take keep trying to unmute me, Mrs. Hoff, instead of JoJo, so. Oh, let's see here. 
There we go. Okay. April, let's go to the next public comment. Tiffany Lawrence. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Tiffany. Good evening, members of the school board. I promise to speak to you tonight with a positive attitude. My name is Tiffany Lawrence and I'm a special education teacher at Valley Oaks and a proud parent to two students in our district. I am here to speak to you again tonight because I am a teacher that matters. In fact, all teachers matter and our voices should be heard no matter what side of the fence we fall on. I was lucky enough to be able to voluntarily come back for small group instruction today with my eight of my 13 students. From the moment I greeted them as they walked up to the gate to get pre-screened to our last goodbyes of the day, we had the best day of the school year by far, all while wearing the appropriate PPE and following all safety protocols put in place. I have never felt so safe during this pandemic. Shout out to our custodians for coming in and sanitizing and cleaning right after our class was finished. I still had my other students zooming in while I was teaching live, and I can say that that worked out better than I had even expected it would to be. I asked my students today, what was the best thing about being in person with me in the classroom? And the responses were all what I had expected to hear. They said there was no distractions, such as younger siblings bugging them, other family members, or even the television to watch minimal technical issues, and we even solved some of the issues that we have had over the past 11 weeks. They said they were able to stay awake and be much more engaged and in general, just learn much more than they did at home. They were all just happy to see everyone, even if we had to wear masks all day. I could see the social emotional benefit of being in person and the impact it had made on my students in just one day of being on campus together. And I cannot wait to see how this continues to get better as we are able to grow and become a quote unquote normal classroom again someday. I am not a what if teacher, I'm a can do teacher. And I know after my experience today, we all can do this all while being safe. I have no doubt in my mind that there will be challenges we will face, but it is how we choose to face them and the attitude we choose to face them with that will determine the outcome. I have been working on campus since the day we began this school year and it has definitely helped me open my eyes and see that this clearly is a possibility. We have had plenty of time to plan. We have known since March now using that excuse is no longer a valid thing. We need to consider the children and what is truly best for the educational future, even if it's not the popular opinion. Thank you guys for your time. Sorry, it's been a long night. <laughs> Thank you, Tiffany. Okay, let's try um, our next public comment. Let's try Jojo T one more time. We still have a hand up from this person. Okay, no luck. So next person, uh, Regina Gonzalez. Oops, how did that help? Good evening. Good evening, Regina. Good evening. My name is Regina Gonzalez, and I am the parent of a student at Greer and another student at McCaffrey. I would like to start by thanking the district and, and the board for their time and diligence, listening to all the concerns presented, making sure precautions are in place to keep our students, teachers, families healthy and safe. I ask that you please consider all that you've heard tonight before you make final decisions. I appreciate all the parents advocating. We are all facing struggles. Being a child's first teacher and supporting their learning is challenging but this is an opportunity to help our children become college and career ready. Our current pandemic is like no other. I would like to thank our teachers. You are true leaders. You are working hard to reinvent learning, uh, reinvent teaching, learning new platforms and recreating all your lessons. It saddens me to think that you may have to relearn everything once again. Classrooms are small confined spaces with poor ventilation. Routines are starting to become just that, routine. Reducing time and changing schedules will, will only cause more stress to both students, teachers, and families alike. I can't even fathom how I'm going to get my child to school on time and picked up on time. And I'm concerned that I'm gonna need busing that I haven't requested and that students will be seating two, seat, two students or two children 
to a seat on the bus. It wasn't clear if that was family members or not. I appreciate that you are placing siblings on the same schedule. That's huge for me. I want you to know that my daughter in middle school is indeed thriving. And I say the word thriving, knowing the definition. I have never seen her work so hard. She does stay up late at night, but she is getting college and career ready. It makes me so proud to see her working hard every night, day in, day out. I am very concerned with parents conducting health screening at home. How often are students sent home sick from school? I'd like to know those numbers. How often are students giving fever reducing medicine before being sent to school? Will students have the option to stay distance learning? Will students have the option to stay distance learning with their current teachers? Why are we switching everything up yet again? How many times are students medicated and then sent to school? I am deeply concerned that schools are not conducting temperature checks upon entry to ensure the safety of all the staff members as well as the other children. While children are not getting sick, they are being exposed to COVID and are in turn exposing COVID to elderly caretakers, family members, and are in confined spaces with teachers that may have underlying conditions or are running ragged with low immune systems because they've spent so much time working on developing the distance learning model that they have put in place. It's a slap in the face to your teachers, telling them that all their hard work and efforts were for nothing. You're gonna change it up on them again. I think learning from home is providing more health benefits and the same access to equitable education for many students. Thank you. I, Thank you, Regina. Our next public comment is from Lisa Rhodes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Rhodes, and I am a mother to a fourth grade student at Valley Oaks. Thank you for allowing me a few minutes to speak up on this matter. In my opinion, we need school to get back to normal. And please understand that me being a parent, I'm also wary of my child getting sick. Not so much from Corona, but in general, the flu, seasonal allergies, and even the stomach bug and or lice. But those things we do not hide from. I spend my days really going over the whole spectrum from benefits to risks and through my extensive search, research and many hours spent researching for answers for myself. The only thing I keep coming back to is the CDC website which offers great information. In fact, the website states itself, the best available evidence indicates if children become affected, they are far less likely to suffer severe symptoms. At the same time, the harms attributed to closed schools on the social, emotional, and behavioral health, economic well-being, and academic achievement of children is way higher and our kids are suffering mentally. Aside from a child's home, no other setting has more influence on a child's health and well-being than their school. The in-person school environment does the following. It provides a well-rounded educational instruction supports the development, the development of social and emotional skills, creates safe environments for learning, addresses nutritional needs, facilitates physical activity. And I understand that these things are also being done at home through distance learning, but it's just not the same. Some of our kids that are being forced to distance learn are home alone. They're raising siblings because their parents are working. They're in a home where there are, there are multiple distractions like other immediate family members living in the same home and or technical issues, not to mention the kids who are, hard, are there just alone. Either way, there are issues that can be seemingly leveled if we were allowed to our children to come back into an all day in-person learning. I understand that the risks for teachers is there. I do understand that. But how do grocery stores, fast food chains, police and first responders, along with others allowed to stay open and fully functioning? I can go through a drive through for a burger, have them take my card, swipe it, and return my food and my card after they've touched it all. But my child cannot sit in a classroom for in-person learning. If these are other, if these and other first responders were forced to find a way to make do with the circumstances at hand, why can't teachers? Sanitization is key. Wash your hands, use gloves, wear your PPE while in class, use your protective barriers, clean your classroom, empty your trash bins, 
make sure your classroom is up to par so our kids can get the education they deserve. Come on, you guys. Like, who is this for? Our kids. All kids are suffering at the hands of our educators because of the chance of contracting a virus from a child. But the CDC also states that the following, the United States reports that children and adolescents under the, year, under the 18 years or old account for only 7% of COVID-19 related cases. Based on current data, the rate of infection among younger school children and from students to teachers has been so low, especially if proper precautions are followed. So let's get the proper necessities and guidelines and get our kids back into full days on campus in-person learning environment. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Our next and last public comment is from Kirsten Patrick. We're still trying to connect to Kirsten. It doesn't look as though we're having any luck. Um, Kirsten, your device may be on mute. No, nothing. Okay, that is it for public comment, um, Dr. Shower. Thank you, Ms. Bott. Uh, thank you to everyone who took time out of your evening tonight to speak. Um, a lot to unpack and it's very late. So I just want to say thank you to everyone that spoke. Really appreciated it. Um, we are going to go into one report because of the late hour and we're going to table everything else until our next meeting for, for reports. So we are going to go into... Well, can we... Uh, um, you know... I'm not sure where the other four are at, whether they had oh, some thoughts sorry. coming out of, you know, the public comment that may give the superintendent some direction. Would we be given our three minutes or just, no, you know, go for it. some thoughts? That, you know, it's like, you know, we heard a lot from McCaffrey teachers and staff and, and understanding that we're still struggling to figure out what kind of a model, if a model can work. Um, one thing that really popped out at me is, is student support. So what does that look like, you know, coming out? Um, if, if uh, you know, they don't have teacher access as a result of coming in uh, and doing the AV model, I, you know, I, am really concerned about any kind of momentum or rhythm that has been established and bringing in a model that's going to create some kind of disruption in terms of as it affects how a student learns um, and having to relearn and, and, and start things over. Um, I think we, you know, we need, need to continue to, to work on providing clear, simple communication to to our groups, whether it's our employee groups, our parents, really understanding what is going on. And, and we need to start getting to a point of understanding what kinds of decisions, at least with our employees, if we are gonna come back, who's in and who's out, because we need to start figuring out logistics, because I think that's something that um, it's not really clear that we, that I think leadership, district employees groups, need time to kind of you know figure this out whatever model we go with um it has to be adaptable because if we do have to go back to distance learning i hate to see for us to come into something it being disruptive um and taking a week for people to get into a new system and then having to go back uh for some reason because there's an outbreak and then having to to revert back and again more disruption um so being thoughtful, you know, of that as, as we move forward, I, 
you know, I wish it was a way to live stream so that there's an option so that it's more consistent. And it seems like that's, you know, the, the path of least resistance to where, um, where, you know, there is an option and, and all, you know, 20, 25, 32 students are in the same place at the same time, at least with the learning, maybe not physically. Um, I'm not sure how long it would take for us technology to kind of get there. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm really curious to see with the small cohorts that we're having that just kind of started what that looks like and, and maybe needing more time, you know, for that to evolve. We've heard some positive things, at least from, you know, from at least, you know, one teacher, a couple teachers. Um, so yeah, that, those are some, some of the notes. I hope, hopefully, you know, we do take time to, you know, to do this in a way that's, that's not going to be quite so disruptive. We don't need to shoehorn. We don't need, need to rush. I think, you know, it's more important in terms of our guiding principles about how we transition and what does that look like. Um, I appreciate all the McCaffrey teachers that spoke tonight. However, um, because I'm living the nightmare, is I don't know one teenager I didn't understand this. What can I do to improve my grade? You know, plus you have to remind students because, you know, as soon as like 115 hits or whenever the school day hits, they're done. They're out. They are checked out. So then where are the working parents, the ones at work, what are they doing? Calling, texting, interrupting their work day, tell their kids, hey, you need to get on this office hour after already being on the computer for five hours to figure out what you're doing. And if there's 85% passing rate in a class, why aren't teachers reaching out to those that aren't doing well? Also, <laughs> in addition, these are just some of my thoughts since I'm living this literally is, you know, they say that with the AB model that teachers aren't going to be available. Okay, just because I have an eighth grade, so I've been in the system for eight years. When have after school teachers been available? I mean, that's like, you know, say your kid goes home, oh, I need to go turn this in. They can't go back to class at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So when the teachers are saying that, you know, they're not going to be available, they're really not, even when we're in class, unless you make an appointment with them. I mean, it's... Am, am, am well, I that, I think the argument was at least the accessibility is greater on Zoom because you could figure another appointment time versus if they in. get on the office hour. So it kind of goes, yeah, you know, yeah, back yeah. around like just this vicious cycle, you know, but yet teachers are available for, by, by an email during, um, you know, whenever, even during the regular school year when they're in the class or via Zoom. Um, but even sometimes, you know, with some teachers, you know, you have to turn in stuff and then you have to remind the kids, okay, did you go into your Google Classroom and private message your teacher to tell them you turned in something? I mean, it's, it's becoming a struggle. 11 weeks in and I'm exhausted. And I know other parents are too. Right. I, well, I, and, all that I'm advocating for is that we need to look at other models. There's, there's not so much. And maybe, you know, maybe there is a situation where that may take a little bit longer. I don't know. I mean, I have a, you know, that Wes, you've been vocal as, you know, as a middle school parent too. And, and, very similar to what Grace had to say. Um, yeah, the uh, listening to the McCaffrey teacher and everything, and seeing that schedule, and then talking about it, I, I, I wrote something right here. I, 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 the middle school mixing has me has, has brought up a, a question mark for me because now I'm thinking this is going to be 300 kids. I, I, it's one thing if the team you stick with your team. Now we're going to have all that mixing. 
and all that other stuff. So I, I just, uh, is there a way that we can work a schedule out where they were, they're with the team? So like there's a team on the campus, like the seventh grade team, the eighth grade team, and they can just stay with their team. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, the mixing's got me. And the exploratory classes are, you know, something that's, we talked about that mixing where it seems like that's, yeah. That's, that's where the challenge is, because mm -hmm. the teams stay in their cohorts throughout the day, except for the collegial and perennial, the exploratory yeah. and Mr. Silva, could you please speak up? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. It's late. <laughs> it's late, yeah, I'm like, my, my volume, I think, just kind of got turned down after a while. Um, I used to have a couple of thoughts, I think it's my turn. It's just something I, because it's something I've, I've, I've heard consistently tonight that, that concerns me, and it's the word transparency. I've heard that a lot tonight. And, and so I, I think what I'm concerned about, and I think it goes, and, and it really leads into a question, is, is I want to know why people think we're rushing into a plan because I've been obviously here all along, been asking great questions and been getting great answers. I think every time I've asked a question of staff, they've given me a detailed answer as to what that, that question is. If it's a procedural thing, they're explaining to me, well, this is how we're going to do this, it's covered. But I think the disconnect and what I'm hearing from public comment is that somehow that message, that information is not getting from us to them. That there is not an easily accessible way for parents to get the information about the plan as we are discussing. And I think last Friday, the FAQ that was sent out was an excellent first step in us providing that information to the parents. I think for us, the logical next step is to figure out how do we deliver that information to the parents? How do we make sure that, that you know, if a parent has a question about, well, what does this look like at this school? How do these parents know to go to our district website as opposed to say maybe their individual school website? But there's and even some pushback with context of, you know, like the survey. Well, you know, you asked me if I wanted to come back to school. You didn't ask me if I wanted my kid to come back to school for two hours. Um, there was another thing about the oh. FAQ that it said one thing and, and it could have been interpreted you know, a variety of different ways. Um, so so I just think that that's, and, and that's why I'm saying, you know, there seems to be confusion. You know, obviously the parents, you know, not all the parents know what we know. And, and I'm just saying, I think that we need to find a way to deliver that information that it is accessible to the parents so that they can make, as they've said, they want to be able to make informed decisions and we need to enable them, we need to empower them to be able to make those informed decisions. Um, that's the only point I want to talk about tonight is I think transparency, I think we are very transparent amongst ourselves. I think we need to find a way to make sure that they see that we're transparent. And, and to what degree when we, when a decision is made or when things are changing, because we really didn't address this, but I heard this a little bit in public comment about, you know, a potential separation of someone that you built a relationship with, mm -hmm. with your teacher, and because a decision a teacher may have to make or choose to make versus what a parent may have to make or choose to make and creating, you know, a rift. I, you know, I'm not sure how to, how we would, you know, bridge that gap again. You know, having something like technology with live stream, at least, you know, and we heard that with the special ed teacher where she's able to do that mm -hmm. simultaneously. But we would have to evaluate how many levels of support, you know, does a teacher need to provide, you know, to help do this simultaneously. I'm actually, you bring up a good point. I'm surprised we didn't hear more about the possibly not having the same teacher, you know, for whatever reason when they go back, because that seemed to be kind of a, an issue and it, it is a concern with We did hear it a lot. You have to understand that a lot of the public comment, probably 75% was 
probably employees. And, and the 25%, I would say a, a good number talked about the, mm -hmm. the possibility of, of their child losing their teacher and what that. Right. Well, and it's a bigger concern, I know, than just the 25% that spoke tonight. That's yeah. what I'm trying to convey. Yeah. It's late. <laughs> My thoughts are jumbled. <laughs> at 1130 at night. Yeah. It's, it's closer to midnight. So. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> you brought up the wood point. I think a, a, a lot of the issue could be kind of solved with the live streaming. The live streaming, if the Lawrence used to live, live streaming, and I know Michigan Pearl uses like the live streaming. So I'm just wondering, and, and maybe it's going to come down to the cost, and I don't know my, how the teachers feel about it, but the ones that use it, it sounds like it's it's, it's a great it's a great piece of technology to have. Uh, I don't know if there, we can look into more to more live streaming and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and take that a could, look at that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and again, just the aspect of where um, an educator, a teacher, can have a number of students in the class, but again, there can be students that are assigned to that teacher that are not in the classroom, but he or she then can be instructing uh, virtually, somewhat simultaneously. Thank the continuity you. kind of, you know, even yeah. though. Mm -hmm. That way you give a parent that says, I want my child to have that teacher, but I don't want to send them to school. Yeah. Well, they can still stay home, do mm -hmm. the distance learning from with mm -hmm. the same teacher. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just, yeah. How do colleges do it? Because I took a class like that back in like 1998, yeah. <laughs> where it was actually on cable, mm -hmm. and we could it was at Kasumas, mm -hmm. and we could go into the classroom if you wanted to be, you know, if I had other classes on campus, or if I couldn't go to school that day, I yeah. could watch it on cable. Yeah, that's the same way. I'm back and, way back. Yeah. And we could call in when we had questions, and I mean, technology is so much better than that yeah. now. Yeah, they would film it. It was like biology class. You film it live. You could do that at home. Yeah, um, but on the flip side there's also has to be that conversation is you know I'm a teacher and I live with my mom who's 96 yeah. and I'm not going to be going back to class students yeah. parents do you understand that you know yeah. if we're going to stay together you know so it's you know, there's two sides of this conversation because you know student, it may be more important for them to go back and You know, tonight, um, for the, when you got to the action item that was tabled, there were specifics that were shared publicly tonight that I've not sent out to all parents or all staff. And my thought is that that might be one of my next steps here is to think about that and maybe an FAQ to go along with it to try to, to work to get that out by Friday. That again um, shares some of the same information with timelines some sample schedules of what that looks like. Do you still have your your DAC, your district advisory committee? We're gonna start that back up. Because I would really advise that before you submit things out like FAQs, run them by some parents mm -hmm. to say, yes. you know, does this make sense yeah. or, you know. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and then I, I, I appreciate that feedback. And, and again, so, Again, my intent then is to share that we are looking at um, a transition week of November 16th for staff reporting the teachers and that, um, you know, looking at a potential timeline that our small cohorts would continue through uh, before Thanksgiving and to reopen um, uh, some type of launching the week of the November, November 30th, which is December 1st, is when students would uh, it's the week of November 30th. And again, we do work with our unions next week also. But there, I, again, I had not sent specific information on AM, PM schedule. I told parents two to four days a week, and there were reasons mm -hmm. for that. Um, there's information that I shared with you tonight that I could I could put out. And I, again, I, I, understand, I appreciate the feedback too about reaching out to parents to take a look too we do it but that would be the goal to get that out by friday anything else logistics you really need to be worked out and if it takes more time it takes more time
Okay. All right. That helps. Thank you. Um, let's go on to the other reports, the Williams Uniform Complaint Process Quarter 1. Yes, that would be the only, the other reports we will um, bring back at another time. Yes, yes, and uh, I, I just, this is somewhat of a time sensitive one. It is the last item and um, it's the quarterly report for sufficiency of textbooks, facilities, and any misassignment of teachers. We had no complaint on that. That was it. Um, again, I appreciate all the public comment tonight. I appreciate all the hard work from our administrative staff and our district office and our teachers out there on Zoom. I know you guys are you guys are all doing amazing, and it's very much appreciated. All right, there's no other comments or questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mr. Bye Claude. bye. <laughs> Might be the record. This beats the, uh, the McCaffrey one for closing schools. Yeah. We're talking about it. I would like